So thank you uh, all of you for joining us from all across the country today. And uh, I think many of you know me, so, um, but uh, some of you may be new. And uh, so I'll begin with my introduction. My name is Roli Mathur. I am uh, working as scientist uh, F and presently heading the ICMR Bioethics Unit, which is also the WHO Collaborating Center for Strengthening Bioethics in Biomedical and Health Research and which is probably the first such center in all of Southeast Asia region of WHO. And I'm also honored to be designated as the nodal officer, as well as the scientific advisor for the, uh, the Department of Health Research National Ethics Committee Registry. And it gives me an immense pleasure to welcome all of you today for this event organized by ICMR Bioethics Unit in collaboration with Department of Health Research. And we are very glad that uh, officials from uh, Department of Health Research are amongst us today. And uh, we will have a one-to-one -one conversation and it's an opportunity for ICMR institutions uh, to, uh, uh, to update themselves a little more about uh, the registration process and some of the other updates on in the area of research ethics. And uh, for the welcome, I will invite uh, Dr. Prashant Mathur, Director NCDR, to give the welcome address and then we'll proceed uh, on with the program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roli, and good morning to everyone. I'm Dr. Prashant Mathur, Director, ICMR, NCDR, Bangalore. We are very honored to host this joint workshop with the ICMR Bioethics Unit, which is located in NCDIR Bangalore and the Department of Health Research. Uh, most of the ICMR institutes have joined us online and we had sent out these invitations for the ethics committee members of the institutes as well as uh, other interested staff who would benefit from this interaction. Uh, the workshop is aimed at around uh, strengthening the capacity of the ethics committees for biomedical health research and also to encourage registration. We know that with the new drugs and clinical trials rule, 2019, the ICMR ethical guidelines are now part of the rules and the law. So any institution which is involved in biomedical research has to register with the DHR on their NETIC portal. So many institutes of ICMR have very successfully registered. Some are in the process. And I would really take this opportunity to urge everyone, those who have yet not made an attempt to complete the process. And if there are any hindrances, if you have immediate questions for today, we will try to answer them at the best possible. Otherwise in future also, you can contact either the DHR secretariat or the NCDIR ICMR unit so that we can facilitate the process. During this also, please share this information with other medical colleges and institutions who are involved in this health research to register their ethics committees with DHR. It is now mandatory. To take this program forward, uh, we are also very blessed by having Dr. Vasanta Muttuswamy, former senior deputy director general uh, ICMR headquarters, chairperson of the ICMR Central Ethics Committee on Human Research, and also chairman of the NCDIR Advisory Committee on Ethics to be, as, to be present with us online as a faculty and a source of inspiration of which many of us from the ICMR institutions would be knowing about her. Also, very shortly, we will be joined by Ms. Anu Nagar. She is the Joint Secretary at Department of Health Research, who oversees the implementation of the National Ethical Ethics Registry at DHR. And with her are also attending Dr. Sujata Sina, Scientist D, and Dr. Baluvi, Scientist C from DHR. And from the NCDIR ICMR Bioethics Unit, Dr. Roli and Dr. Dilip are here. 
and the NCDIR ethics committee members will also be joining online. Some other institutions and members of ethics committees are also present. So I look forward to this being a very vibrant discussion and uh, we please use the chat box for your questions in case you are not able to ask questions or we run out of time, it will make it more efficient. And with this, I would like to take this me uh, meeting forward and thank you all for being there and looking forward to very fruitful discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mathur. And uh, uh, I'm coming next in and I will be very happy to uh, provide some brief insights on the ICMR National Ethical Guidelines. Uh, just give me a second so that I can uh, share my screen, Suresh. the ICMR guidelines for ethics committee, uh, uh, which were released during the pandemic. And uh, the third document briefly, which I'll touch upon is the NDCT rules, which have now mandated uh, the registration of ethics committees. And we'll be hearing more details from Dr. Muthuswamy uh, about roles and responsibilities of ethics committee and DHR registration aspects from other speakers today. So this is just a glimpse of some of the documents and I urge everyone to please visit ICMR Bioethics Unit uh, website and uh, just Google in ICMR Bioethics Unit to get a link to all uh, these documents which could be downloaded. And uh, we'll be very happy to provide you with hard copies of any document that you would want to have. The latest release that we have already shared with all ICMR institutions is the one in the middle. It is a book of first of its kind, which is a uh, volume one of the bioethics perspectives in the Indian context, uh, edited by myself, Dr. Muthuswamy and Dr. Nandini K. Kumar. And it is uh, basically, we did not have enough literature in the sense of a book, which could be used for teaching and training uh, methods. And this is a book that is uh, filling in that gap. And this is a first volume, but we will be coming out with the second volume uh, within a year or so. Uh, so uh, you all know that during emergency, when COVID came, it was very important that we had to come out with the new guidelines because suddenly the life of ethics committees changed. They were used to meeting physically in the rooms and there were certain requirements, uh, attendance requirements, but uh, this was a time when uh, ethics committees had to move, uh, you know, meet very quickly, uh, do fast track reviews without compromising on the quality of their review processes. And they had to meet virtually because of the change scenarios. And these guidelines were able to provide some of the key elements in order to obtain that. And I feel very happy to tell you that India was probably an ICMR has been leading the bioethics area, that we were probably the first in the world to come out with the guideline as early as in April uh, 2020. And it talked about not only review of COVID related research, but also non COVID and new research studies that need to be uh, reviewed. Now, these are the principles of bioethics and uh, you are all aware, principle of autonomy or respect for persons, uh, beneficence to do good and to avoid harm, non-maleficence, to make sure the research is done in a manner that no one is discriminated against fairly. So the principle of justice and the scope of the guideline extends not only to biomedical health research, but also to any socio-behavioral research that is conducted uh, related to research. And on your right hand side, you see the general principles as outlined in the guidelines. 
the importance of need for the research or principle of essentiality, making sure that people voluntarily agree and not are forced or influenced to take part in research. They have the opportunity to say yes or no. There is no exploitation. Also the way research is done, the way protocols and methodologies are written, we have to be socially responsible to see that we do not disrupt the fabric of the society and research is done in a manner that protects the community values, making sure how the information that is identifying is collected and it's going to be stored uh, with whom it is going to be shared, how long is it going to be um, uh, you know, stored, all those things we need to work out at the time you're developing the methodology. Not just saying that the risks are less or risk, there's not much risk, but are there any ways in which these risks could be minimized or and benefits can be maximized? So this is how we need to think in an ethical manner to in the way the research studies are being framed. Studies have to be done by people who are professionally competent. One person may not have all the expertise, so it is not just that the co competence of the uh, PI is to be seen, but it is the competence of the whole team. The research investigating team has to display the uh, competencies. The site should have required facilities in order to do the research. Then uh, totality of responsibility as stakeholders of research, the, whether it is researchers or ethics committees or sponsors or institutions or the regulators, all of us have our own share of responsibilities, which we need to follow in order for that research to be ethical. So it is not that uh, that researcher thinks this is the institution will do and the institution thinks this the ethics committee is going to see. So it is a totality of responsibility that lies with all the stakeholders and institutions have to make appropriate arrangements for the EC office, for um, dedicated manpower, protected time for member secretary to meet for, uh, you know, in case a medical management is required in case there has been an injury during research. So all those provisions have to be made by the institution. Now, there are three things that are suggested in the guideline. One is that one could do it through taking insurance coverage, or it could be through building your research grants, or from your corpus funding or your overhead charges, you could ask for grants. When you write up your projects, when researchers write their projects, they must think about it, depending on the risk involved, to try to build into compensation. It may be there for pharmaceutical supported research, but for academic studies or thesis or other, you know, studies that are done by investigators, uh, these things have to be developed. Then principle of transparency and accountability, you need to have, you need to be accountable to what version of protocol, what version of uh, informed consent form that is approved by the ethics committee is being used. We cannot make amendments on our own. We have to take uh, permissions from ethics committees if we have to uh, you know, follow. And also once the research is completed, these results should be published. They should come out in the public domain. Also a good practice is to register your research in the clinical trial registry of India to improve this transparency um, uh, and share this information. Protecting environment, we all understand how we need to be uh, protective of our resources, which are very limited. So that was another principle that was added in the 17 guideline. On your left, you see all the sections of the guideline. There are 12 sections. And on your right, you see the five sections that are there in the COVID-19 guidelines. And these are the COVID-19 guideline is an add-on to the main guideline document. So I'll just briefly touch upon some of these uh, because of time, uh, it's, uh, it needs full lecture on these topics. Uh, so benefit risk assessment is not a mathematical formula, but one has to do it as a researcher as well as at the ethics committee level. So researchers should not think that it is only the ethics committee responsibility, but at the time the proposal is being built up, they must make sure that benefits and risk, uh, what are the benefit, what are the risks, are they uh, acceptable? how privacy, like I discussed, are being, uh, is going to be taken care of, how individuals or communities or people are not uh, being targeted, or how, uh, you know, we are, selection of participants is being done in an equitable manner. Uh, 
there has to be meaningful community engagement how we communicate how we do advocacy how we educate or talk to people because that is very important anybody who participates in research should not be made to pay extra for investigations or tests and uh, if there has been any injury that has happened that cost should be covered provision should be there for storing the material you should know for how long you are going to store this material for what it will be used so that the informed consent could be built into thinking about all these considerations there are conflicts of interest that need to be managed whether it is at the investigator level or institutional level or at the ethics committee level and uh, we it is an important requirement that our study outcomes are uh, of course they lead to publications but that's not the end of it we have to see how they are communicated back translated for public health benefits and rapid collaborations are required during this time because we need to collaborate uh, well but of course we should have transparent policies in place for uh, you know collaborations also there is discussed uh, in the guidelines about how public health and socio behavioral research required an extra attention at this time the role of agencies governance of research is another important aspect that is often not taken care of so it has to be strengthened and bio safety and safety of the healthcare workers training gadgetry that needs to be provided to keep them safe is extremely important the third section of guideline is on rcr the responsible conduct of research and as you are aware uh, icmr also came up with the policy called the right policy the research integrity and publication ethics so it is not only at the time of publication where we talk of publication ethics but how the research has been conducted the way research is conducted are you following the protocol fully what kind of collaborative uh, uh, agreements are there how you follow the sops all these things have been addressed in this section the fourth section is on ethics committees and uh, dr muthusamy will be talking about in more detail uh, so i am not touching upon it but i'll just try to point out that there are three categories of ethics review exemption from review expedited review and full committee review depending on the kind of risk that is involved you could apply to the ethics committee and for exemption and expedited these could be fast tracked by the secretariat of the ethics committee and only the full committee a full proposals which involve risk need to go to the full committee informed consent the new development has been discussion about electronic consent of course on your left hand side you see the basic elements so we don't want to bypass this so all this has to be built into the electronic consent process there are also procedures laid out for seeking waiver of consent depending on the kind of research where research cannot practicably be carried out it's on stored material or it is hard to reach back to the participant so in certain scenarios there is a discussion about how waiver of consent can be taken and of course informed consent is meaningful disclosure competence of the individual to understand that deliberation give time for question answer and uh, only then comes the signing part and it does not end with signing because informed consent is a process it is not a one time signing or sheet of paper people who are vulnerable or who are not able to protect their own rights should not just be excluded blanketly many studies we have seen they say all vulnerable will be excluded if you exclude them from research studies that means the benefits that come out of the research will also not apply to them so it is very important that wherever possible maybe not possible in every type of study such as clinical trial may not be possible but wherever possible one should try to include vulnerable but then make sure that there are additional safeguards or procedures some extra effort is there so that these groups of people or persons can be protected there's a whole chapter on clinical trials uh, clinical trials or are of broadly i would say two types one is regulatory trial which require the drugs controllers office permission which has to follow the new drugs and clinical trial rules but then there are also clinical trials of other nature which are on approved marketed products uh, which are non regulatory in nature and they need to follow the icmr guidelines there are two sections one is on public health research the other one is on socio behavioral research these have discussed the tricky areas which are you know often gray areas also where you are involved in doing demographic studies or surveillance programs program evaluations observational studies or using qualitative designs so there are new set of requirements that are there for such studies 
Genetics is another important section. So if you're engaged in genetics research, this is a section that is relevant to you. It has discussed about the latest technologies, CRISPR or gene editing, and what are the ethics issues that are involved in that. Biobanking data set is the 11th section, maybe relevant to each one of us, because in some way or the other, uh, we may be dealing with either samples or data. And uh, it, the, the way ICMR guideline has done it is they have qualified this into three categories, anonymous, anonymized, or linked. So if the samples are linked, you need informed consent. If they are anonymized, uh, totally anonymous, you cannot reach back, then you could, of course, ask for a waiver of consent or the kind of uh, review that you ask from the ethics committee that could depend on that. And then the samples which are coded or linked or, co you know, you need another set of um, requirements. Uh, the last section of the guideline is on emergency, but this has been further expanded. This was there in the 2006 guideline also and expanded in 17, but now in the COVID-19 guideline. Another important uh, document that came out was a brief SOP that was prepared. So every ethics committee of ICMR institutions or any other institution across the country could just download and adopt this SOP because this is for undertaking emergency review. And on your right, you see the handbook. This is the handbook, the DG ICMR, uh, when he joined in, he said, you know, the guidelines are excellent, but they are very big. So it is important to have a thin booklet, which would be useful for students and researchers. So this is just a 20 page summary of the main guidelines. So it may be useful for many of the researchers or students, please feel free to ask for more copies from us if you need. All, of course, they can be downloaded. The last one that you see on your right is the RIPE policy. It is important that all ICMR institutions follow the RIPE policy. And uh, then, this, uh, then ICMR has also prepared some common forms and checklists. And this is a very important rule for the ethics committee. So all the ethics committees who have joined here, I urge you all that if your uh, committees are not having forms for submission, these are the formats that are made available. There are 14 forms that we have prepared available on our website. Please download them and use them. And as you can see, the space for logo is vacant. You can put your logo. They are available in Word as well as PDF format. The thing is that what happens is in many committees, when the proposal is submitted, you find there are a lot of things missing. And often there is back and forth communication. So these forms, this is just a list of all the forms that are there and a glimpse of all this. This helps you in streamlining the ethics review process. So there is a form. So investigator themselves can fill up the form for expedited review or exemption from review. So they will know that what are the reasons for, for, for what reasons can they apply to an ethics committee for exemption from review. So it becomes like a self checklist. And also you give the relevant information to the ethics committee, it saves time for the secretariat to take decisions. Similarly, there is essay reporting form violations, amendments, all these are forms are separate form for clinical trials, um, and then public health research, genetics, final report format, CV formats are also there because I have often seen that uh, CVs of, you know, researchers, you know, active researchers, their CV run into 30 pages. And that is the struggle we are having at DHR also 30, 40, 50, 60 pages CVs also we are seeing. But we are the ethics committee's interest is to see what is their, uh, you know, uh, for ethics committee members, of course, what, what is their training in ethics or what is their, uh, you know, exposure to ethics. And similarly for research Researchers to tell about what studies they are doing, which are relevant. This is just a glimpse of the CECHR under the leadership of Dr. Muthuswamy. Uh, the CECHR was uh, uh, reconstituted by DG ICMR, and we have taken fast track reviews of all types of research. And uh, lastly, I'll come to the NDCT rules, which has, uh, which has led to setting up of the National Ethics Committee Registry on Biomedical and Health Research. And uh, DHR has set up the NETIC portal and uh, Government of India has notified this under chapter four. So even academic research, biomedical health research is now uh, regulated. So indirectly, ICMR ethical guidelines have become a law in the country. And this is the press release that was given by ICMR in this regard. 
uh, like I said, we have a website where all these documents can be downloaded. We also have put together a number of international documents that may be of relevance to all of you. I urge you to visit. This is a glimpse of some of our activities where we have contributed as members of WHO committees in number of WHO guideline documents that have come out during the last uh, few last two years. Also, I'm happy to share with you, um, and I'm sure NIE is also with us, and NIE has initiated this program, uh, Ethics EEC training course for members of Ethics uh, Committee. I urge all the members of Ethics Committees of ICMR Institutes to please join this course because this is, uh, uh, you know, we have very few opportunities for in-depth training of ethics committee member. And this is one of these uh, best initiatives in the country. So uh, please visit this and please uh, attend this course. And this is a book I mentioned in the beginning, which has just come out. Uh, please, we are happy to provide copies for libraries and institutions. We have already sent. If you want more copies, we'll be happy to provide more copies of the document. Otherwise, it can also be purchased from Amazon. If you are interested in more personal uh, copies, then you could buy it from Amazon or from the JP Publisher website. And again, I come to the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, once again, thank you all for joining in today. And uh, uh, I think we are slightly yeah exactly on time oh that's perfect we are running on time uh, and if there's any burning question i would be happy to answer to you before we move on to our next speaker any questions uh, you could type in the chat box is nothing but uh, you could Madam, raise Dr. your hands NIRT. yes please Please. Where do we stand with respect to the common ethics forum? Like, for example, when we are having studies or RCTs, especially in the COVID period, when we, when we require permission at a, at a faster level. So there is, there is actually a very difficult situation where at one point you need to balance between ethics and the other point you have to balance between getting the approvals done and doing it on time. Because COVID is not a disease uh, which is going to persist for long. So before the, the wave closes, people would be doing that. But when it comes to institutional ethics approval, it goes to each of the institutions and it gets stopped. So uh, there was some uh, thing, I think uh, Vasna Mutsami Varma was also there. So uh, if you can add on to tell where exactly are we with respect to this common ethics forum or common ethics committee? Yes, uh, thank you for this question. And for that purpose, I have put together another presentation uh, towards the end. I'll be speaking to you at 11.45 on this topic. So I think I'll reserve my answer to that time. Yes, we have worked on that. Yes, I think we have a question in the chat box. Uh, Uh, yes, uh, so I'm, uh, I would like to answer to Dr. Padma Priya Darshini that uh, yes, uh, this, uh, the, the SA reporting forms, we have prepared two set of forms. One is for biomedical health research. The second one is for clinical trials. The one for clinical trials is in line with the DCHGI form. Yes, it is true. Uh, they are templates for SOPs. Yes, we are trying to develop a template for SOPs. Uh, actually, we are trying to simplify the SOPs because as of date, whatever SOP formats that we have downloaded and received from various institutions such as FERCAP and FERSI and some international, we have found that they are uh, quite uh, long and extensive and we are actually in the process for developing simplified SOPs. Hopefully, we will be coming out with the SOPs very soon. For e-consent, uh, we do not have any gu special guideline, uh, but I think uh, a number of investigators have tried the e-consent, and I think we need to look at the literature on that. Uh, we, do, we have not developed any guidelines on e-consenting, or I'm not aware of it. Uh, website. Uh, sorry, uh, I think uh, Dr. Anjali has asked, can you share website? Or oh, you just Google in ICMR bioethics unit and you will come to our page. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll type it also. Yeah. I'll put the link for the, in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Roli, for e-consent, I think we can record the consent of the participants. Yes. 
Uh, yes, so there are various ways you could yeah, do we, it we electronically. Did COVID. We did it during COVID. We had a uh, telephonic uh, interviews, so we recorded their consent. Correct. So you could do a telephonic recording. You could. The idea is that the ethics committee would like to see the evidence that there has been a consenting process and there's no misuse. So there should be. It could be through emails. It could be through your apps, which could be developed, or your telephonic recordings, or you could think of any audiovisual mechanism of recording the consent. The whole idea is that it happened in a proper manner. Yes. Thank you for that question. And uh, I think there's one question from Dr. Shalini about the charges for ethics committees, which are uh, reasonable. Uh, I leave that question to Dr. Muthu Swami to answer later. <laughs> I do not have any guideline on that. Um, and uh, so I think uh, we'll have more questions uh, uh, as we move along. And we are happy to welcome ma'am, Dr. Anu uh, Mrs. Anu Nagar has joined us uh, just now. And uh, I'll, yeah, I think the director will uh, like to probably speak a bit. I'll come back to you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ms. Nagar, for joining us. Uh, so we started the program. We have all the ICMR institutions, the ethics committee members, chairperson of the ethics committee, and other scientists. And uh, the even the NCDR, IEC, had to come here physically, but because of the incessant rains in Bangalore, they decided not to come physically, but they are joined online. Uh, so, uh, would like to say any opening remarks, or otherwise we have a session at the last. I think I'm coming to end. I can first listen. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. We'll carry on. So, thank you, um, uh, ma'am. And uh, so now I'll uh, I'm happy to move on to the next session by Dr. Vasanta Muthuswamy, and uh, we'll request ma'am to speak about the roles and responsibilities of ethics committee members. And I'm sure she needs no introduction to this audience, but still I always feel honored to introduce her. And if I may lovingly call her the mother of uh, research ethics in India, because she's, she has pay, played such a stellar role at ICMR and, uh, and now um, also after she is retired uh, during the last three decades. And she uh, of course was the formerly the senior deputy director general and head of division of basic medical sciences and uh, traditional medicine division of reproductive health and nutrition at ICMR headquarters. And she has been well recognized for bringing out the ICMR national guidelines in 2000 and then subsequent uh, re revisions in the year 2006 and 2017. Also, she has played an important role in various national and international committees on developing ethics related guidelines. She is a founder secretary for the Forum for Ethics Committee Review in Asia and Pacific and president for FERSI, which is the Indian uh, Forum for Ethics Committees in India. And she's internationally recognized for her leadership and has received several Lifetime Achievement Awards. She is currently the chairperson of the ICMR Central Ethics Committee on Human Research and well known across the country for her contributions in the area of ethics. It's indeed an honor to have you, ma'am, to deliver a talk on uh, roles and responsibilities of ethics committee members. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am, would you like to share your screen? Yes, my screen is visible. Yes, ma'am. Okay, good morning to everybody. And good morning, Dr. Mathur, and good morning, Ms. Nagar, for joining this. And uh, having decided to have this meeting, is uh, it's a very, very important uh, time where you have taken this decision because this was very much needed. I was always worried about. Uh, the ICMR institutes all being not up to the level where which we have, we want them to be as far as the ethics committee functioning is concerned. I'm sure this meeting will make many of the institutes, uh, you know, uh, come to that level which some of the institutes are having, which I'll speak in the 
during my talk now the i so i decided to talk about the roles and rational ethics committees now we are we are having all the ethics committees of icmr institutes who are attending today many of them are most of the people are known to me all the younger ones i may not know me and i don't know them the chairpersons are there the member secretaries are there and i can see some of the directors also there that shows the interest which they have in this very important activities as i go along you will realize why we are giving so much emphasis on ethics committees now when we talk of research the and the concept of good clinical practice which is actually good clinical research practice we talk of the international scientific and ethical quality standard for doing research and one of the important aspect of that is to is patient safety that is the protect the rights of the research subjects and participants in icmr we don't like to use the word subjects we decided as early as 2006 that subject word itself is unethical because you are giving an inferior status to somebody who is actually the most important person in research and we have changed the word subject to participant in 2006 but unfortunately the gcp still says subject and so the regulators are still using the word subjects so we are you forced to put the word subject here and after our you know insistent we can take credit icmr can take credit in this after in many international forum we have been talking about it now the entire western world have started using the word participants and still our regulator use the word subjects anyway i hope when they do the next revision they will change it now when we look at all the stakeholders responsibility which is given in gcp because we always talk of gcp training for the researchers gcp training for the ethics committee members and so this good clinical research practice guidelines gives the responsibility of different stakeholders now what is interesting is that what is the main responsibility of all of them all of the stakeholders whether you are a sponsor you are a cro you are a monitor you are investigator yourself the site staff and the institutions whether you are an ethics committee member or you are a regulatory authority the entire response the responsibility of all of them is only one thing it is the safety and well being of the patients the participants the lg volunteers who are participating in research whatever is there we have to do good research the best of research all those things are there as a main responsibility for doing research but we are in the process what is important is the safety and well being of the research participants whether they are patients or volunteers or whatever it is and in that if you look at the, all the stakeholders everybody has some vested interest whether it is a sponsor the cro's and monitors who have to answer the sponsors the investigator who have multiple reasons for doing research and the site staff and the institution themselves and of course the regulatory authorities have to do the regulations everybody seems to have some vested interests of course apart from the regulatory authorities so the only or the only group in this the stakeholder in this which is not directly connected to any of them and who is the who has been given the moral responsibility to take care of the safety and well being of the participants is the institutional ethics committee and that's why one has to understand the roles and responsibilities of ethics committees many people still think it's a formality you have to get an igc approval before you go ahead with the research because you need an igc approval for getting funding otherwise the sponsors are not going to give funding so it's a more a formality which is being done without realizing it's not just a formalities and that is the most important component of doing research so when we look at the entire twin pillars of protection as far as the research participants are concerned one is of course the informed consent process which is the most important because there only we assess the autonomy of the individuals who are participating but anyway that's taken care by the ethics committees so the independent review by an ethics committee which i got you can call it by any name internationally they say irb the ethics review committees ecs igcs and what not including independent ethics committees the word independence doesn't mean you have to be an independent committee not associated with the institution the independence here means the independence to take a decision without being unduly influenced by the the institutional heads or anybody else for that matter and they they are able to take an independent decision and that's the reason it's called an independent review by an ethics committee 
And so that's the most important. So we just look into that, that why we think that this is important. What is this committee? It's a committee of group of interdisciplinary members and who review the clinical research. As you all know that when we talk of clinical research in India, it's not that the research involving the human beings themselves or who are the research participants, even using their biological materials or the data is also a concern at the clinical research. So if you do research using the individuals themselves or the biological materials or the data, all these are called the clinical research. So any clinical research proposal has to come to the ethics committee for approval because each one has its own ethical implications which have to be assessed by the ethics committees before they give the approval. Now, ethics committees are not, not just there to look at ethical issues. It's a permanent debate. Even yesterday, I had a phone call from somebody asking that why should an ethics committee look at scientific aspects? Ethics committee's job is to only look into the ethical issues. They don't have to bother about anything else. Nationally and internationally, the ethics committees are given four responsibilities to look at the scientific aspects. Otherwise, why do you need scientists in an ethics committee? We can only have non-scientists to take decisions. They have to know the local cultural issues before certain decisions are being taken. The socio-economic aspects have to be seen and of course, the ethical issues. Many of course, may, most of you may be knowing, but some of them who are juniors, young, who have joined recently, who are associated with the ethics committees may not know. The ethics committees, when they started in the 60s, late 60s in US, uh, that is for the terminally ill patients, whether to put them on the ventilators or not, or in the organ transplantation, who is going to get the priority in getting the organs when there was a big queue for getting organs, which is of course still a problem in our country. So at the time they decided to have a multidisciplinary committee because they decided the physicians and the scientists alone are not enough to take decisions because they again, they have their own vested interest. They have their own look at it from the scientific aspects without looking into the societal aspects or the human values or the human rights issues. So they decided we should have an interdisciplinary and that's why the lawyers, the social scientists, the lay persons, the theologians, the other religious heads, the philosophers all came into this committee and it became a multidisciplinary committee. And in the, after the, in the early 80s and late 70s, when actually the ethics committees for research was constituted internationally, as well as, as, as you saw that ICMR's first guideline itself came out in 1980, although that was also ready by 78, 79. So it was from that time, it has been decided we should have an interdisciplinary committee. So the committee has, members who can have the capacity to look into the socio-economic issues, the cultural issues, and the scientific aspects. And the responsibility of the ethics committee is to look into both the science as well as ethical issues. There is no debate about it. There are people who question it because for their own reasons, but then they have to understand that the science cannot be separated from ethics because bad science is bad ethics. Although the ethical issues are well taken care of, if the science part is bad, then the whole thing becomes a bad. And so even now we have a lot of experience. I can give examples. I don't want to waste your time now. Being at the ICMR Central Ethics Committee, member secretary for many years, once we had the Justice Venkatele Committee, we have seen many projects which are cleared by the local ethics committees and the sacks of institutes which had come to the Central Committee. Some scientific issues were raised these proposals were sent back for a revision. So science cannot be separated from ethics committees and the ethics committee members have a responsibility to look into both science and ethics. So when you look at it, of course, an ethics committee, we have to look into the structure, then you have to see what are the different functions they have. What is the competence of, can anybody become an ethics committee member? And that's a big question where we'll talk about the training part of it and the independence to take the decision. Now, as far as the criteria of membership is concerned, all of you know, I don't have to go into the details. It's there in the ICMR guidelines, who all should be member, what should be the numbers, it should be there. And why we are having this kind of a multi-sectoral committee, multidisciplinary committee, how the community is represented by the different groups. And we should have a balanced distribution as far as age, gender is concerned and the number. But what is more important is the last part of this slide, the external chairperson 
of a committee is what was decided by the ICMR. In earlier years, in many countries, it's not there. They have the, the members from their own institution who is a chairperson. And here we say the independence of the committee, if we have to maintain and the member, the chairperson is not influenced by any local politics or local influence, they have to be external. And it is now the regulators have also accepted the NDCT rules and earlier the schedule Y also accepted it. So the chairperson should be from outside institution. And of course, the member secretary who has to do the entire work has to be the internal member. Members have to be aware of the social cultural norms. And for any number of subject experts can be invited. It can be patient representatives, community representatives, and wherever necessary, some vulnerable group are involved. In some studies, you can even include them as a special invitees for the committee. There's no restriction of numbers. It depends on the number of projects. And all of the members, whatever is their background, should be ready to sign a confidentiality agreement that whatever is being discussed will not be disclosed outside. And if there is any conflict of interest, they are going to announce it in writing and also give it in writing so that the conflict of interest does not interfere in the decision making process. So the main task of an ethics committee is to look into the scientific merits of research, although it has gone through many scientific committees. And there are many instances where we are finding that doesn't go through any scientific committee and suddenly it comes to the ethics committees. It becomes very difficult for the ethics committees because ethics committee has limited number of clinicians and basic scientists and you can't expect them to know everything. So it's better that ideally all it has to be cleared by a scientific committee containing the correct members who can assess those projects before it comes to the ethics committees. And of course, they evaluate the ethical acceptability of the research proposal by continuously doing a benefit risk analysis. And to also, they have to verify that the research is in conformity with the local culture and their social values. And what is important is as per the existing guidelines and regulations. And this part is important when we come to the training part, uh, you'll realize that why we have to know the existing guidelines and the regulations. And what is another thing important is the responsibility of the ethics committees. In the beginning, it was very not very much. You were to give the committees used to give initial approval and then forget about the whole thing. What happened to the project? Nobody knew. Even now, there are many committees which I am aware because when I see their the ethics approval letters, even of some of the ICMR institutes, I see they see that they give an approval and they say that please the final report should be submitted. What happens in between? What happens during the study? If you go by the GCP requirement, even of 1996, it says that the ethics committee is have to review before the study is initiated, during the study, during the entire process of the study, as well as after completion of the study, including the publishing part, the publication which comes out and see that how the record keeping should be done according to the rules and the regulations and the guidelines. This is something which many of the ethics committees are ignoring. They are not looking into the progress reports and, the pro they are, and some of them asking the progress report to be submitted, but the ethics committees are not going through that, which is not correct because there can be something unethical happening in between. There may be some changes which have been made by the researchers from what it was originally approved and they have not informed the committees. So the committee not only does the initial review, it also has to look into the every amendment which is made, the AEs have to be reported in the report while the SAEs have to be reported. And here we say that even for the non-regulatory studies, we have to follow the regulatory timelines because that's the only one available in this country now. And you have to follow it as per the LCMR guidelines. Any protocol deviations, violations have to be examined. So progress reports, if necessary, sometimes, for example, if there is a stem cell research instead of one year, they may have to even review every six months, every three months. So the ethics committee has to decide that what is the time frame during which you need the progress reports. And of course, you'll have to do the final report, the final, and then what is the outcome of it, whether whatever was promised by the researcher, whether they are able to do that in the outcome. So it has to be there. And then in case of clinical trials, if there is an issue related to the post-trial management, what are the attempts which are being made? It's not necessary. These have to be done only in regulatory trial because drug controller is asking you. Even in the non-regulatory studies, if there is a benefit which can be passed on to the, the participants or the community, then the ethics committees have to look into that. 
So this is how the ethics committees have to continuously do now monitoring before, during, and after the research is done. Now, as far as I, the in India is concerned, like all of us are concerned, the Bible or whatever we say, research, the Gita or Quran for us is the ICMR guidelines. We have to follow the ICMR guidelines strictly. The first one was in 1980. As I said, it was ready in 79 along with the Belmont report, but it was released in 80. The 2001, 2001 is a, the bigger one, which we did under the guidance of Justice Winter Chalaya, and then the subsequent revision. And what is important is now the 2017 guideline, which has now become part of the NDCT rules, the new drug clinical trial rules, has become now a law of the land. Unfortunately, I am seeing that many people, that it's not just in ICMR or outside ICMR, many people in the country are still are talking about 2006 guidelines when they submit their papers and they give reference to the 2006 guidelines. They are not giving reference to 2017 guidelines. 2017 guideline has become part of the NDCT rules means it has become a law of the land. We have to know that we have to follow it. And whatever the NDCT rules says becomes mandatory. And that's the reason we are talking about registration and other things. So everybody has to be aware of the ICMR guidelines. So institutes should conduct training program of the ICMR guidelines to all the research staff, seniors as well as juniors, so that they are aware of the different components of the ICMR guidelines, so that you don't do anything wrong. If anything wrong is done, you can be penalized because it's now the law of the land. Of course, 2020 guidelines is only for COVID related, which Roli said, I'll also give something what the ethics committees were able to do it after these guidelines have come out. Now composition, you all know, I don't have to explain, but what is important is that section 4.2 uh, of the guidelines, uh, section four of the guidelines gives a composition in the ICMR guidelines, which everybody has to see. And as far as the Composition is concerned. One thing which is very, very important, not only the qualification experience, the interest and the commitment with the members have and the willingness to, to become a committee member to go through the proposals properly and to take a serious interest in that is what is important. It is not just to fill up a biodata, you become member of an ethics committee. Each member is appointed for a particular role. You are for a clinician, for a basic scientist, you are a legal expert and uh, you are a, a, the social scientist or a lay person. Everybody has specified roles and one has to understand the specified roles. If you look at the four point, section 4.2 of the ICMR guidelines, which of course I'll just say what it is then. What is other important thing is that we do have, after the COVID has come where we could not, we have to have meeting almost every 24 hours and you can't get uh, all the members attending all the time. And this guidelines became very useful that we can have alternate members. We can have a panel of subject experts. And uh, we can, of course, uh, have you should have a chair and the vice chair in every committee so that when chair is not there, the vice chair can be take over the thing immediately. Of course, where the committees which do not have a vice chair can have an alternate chair who, for, who can be chosen that particular day. And here there's a conflict with the CDSU requirement and NDCT rules. They don't allow a vice chair or an alternate member secretary, which we have been taking up with the regulators for quite some time. And they don't understand that when the ICMR guideline has become a law by themselves, and when we have given certain things in the ICMR guideline that should be given respect, we should allow people to afford. It makes the ethics committee functioning easier, which of course regulators are still not accepting. We are still taking up with them. I'm sure since the joint secretary is here, she'll be able to talk to the regulators and see that some of the things given in the ICMR guideline is to facilitate easy functioning of ethics committees and not to make it very tight fisted or very strict so that the committees don't function. The terms of reference, of course, is there. I've already said the head of the institution uh, will appoint the members and all the other details are there, which of course you people know, I don't have to say. What is important is the SOPs, which the ethics committees have. We made an SOP in 2002 or three, and many institutions still following the old SOPs. Times have changed so much. Water has run under the bridge over the years. And we have now detailed SOPs, about 20, 30 SOPs are there, which as Dr. Roli said, we are trying to streamline and shorten and make them 
uh, now uh, shorter as well as they combine some of the SOP so that it becomes simplified. The, IS, the IS, 2017 guideline has a list of SOPs, but I'm sure that is going to be changed and we are going to combine some of them. So each for every activity of an ethics committee, there is an SOP so that your functioning becomes easier. The SOPs are made to make the for you to know the process for every action. So it's better that all the detailed SOPs are there. All the members have to be also trained in the SOPs. So SOP training is one activity. It's not just training of the other GCP and other things. SOP training is also needed so that every member knows what is given in the SOP. So when you have these multi, multiple, multi-sectoral or multidisciplinary members, naturally everybody is there to do certain roles and responsibilities. The ICMR guidelines table 4.2 gives each one in detail. So I'm not going to the details of everything, but as, as a common sense, we can understand a clinician or a basic scientist will look into the science, uh, scientific aspects and they, everybody has to look into the ethical aspects also. The legal expert will look into the insurance policies, the, you know, the institutional policies, other agreements. Uh, the social scientists will look into the social, cultural, and religious aspect. The subject expert whom we are inviting will be, of course, specifically for a project. They should be expert in that field. The lay persons who are the non-scientists, uh, as well as other non-scientists in the committee, their responsibility is look into the informed consent document and see whether the process is simple enough, the document is simple enough, the translations are perfect, so that the participant can understand before they give a valid consent. So these are there in the table 4.2 gives in detail the roles and responsibility of each one of them. And please go through that carefully. This is something which is important is that we, we say the quorum is five members, any five members, but at least it should have both technical and non-technical. There should be one non-affiliated member and of course, Preferably the lay person should be there, but in the NDCT rules for regulatory trials, the quorum is different where they are very specific that there are five different members have to be there. And so if you're, if you're approving a regulatory trial or examining a regulatory trial and giving approval, your quorum has to be complete. And what is important, which many institutions don't follow is when you give an approval letter, you have to say that the quorum was complete that day and who are the members present during the meeting which I see that many of the institutions are simply not giving that, telling the committee met on such a day, we give approval for your project. That's not the way to write the approval letter. There is a standard approval letter which should be done. So I hope the institutes go through that and give proper uh, the approval letters. At least ICMR institutes as a model should do that so that other institutes can learn it. Now the review part, of course, Dr. Lori said that all of you know that we have a full board review, the ex expedited review, as well as exempt from review. And how to reach the decision, how to do the reviews is also very important, how to give the approvals. And decision of the meeting, unless the quorum is there, your decision is invalid. You will have to remember that if your quorum is incomplete and for a particular project when it was discussed, that's the reason who are the members present should be written in the minutes as well as the approval letter. So that this approval letter, when it goes to any of these sponsors, they will know that the quorum was complete and this is a valid approval letter. So it should be remembered by everybody and please all of you learn how to write a proper approval letter. Now, when we ask the members to do the review, there are two kinds of review. One is a protocol review. This is for the scientific aspects. The scientists and the basic scientists will do. The others also will read to understand. But the non as I said, that non-medical, non-technical members they have to look into the informed consent document, both the patient information sheet and the informed consent form with the translations have to be seen by them. And that is why what we say is there is an assessment form or a review form which should be filled by either all the members as in some committees or by the primary and secondary reviewers. That is one is a technical member, one is a non-technical member. They have to fill up so that, you know, these review forms have all the valid points which ICMR uh, guidelines has given. For example, the checklist in the, as far the ICMR 2017 guidelines will be there in the review form. It will take care of all the principles of autonomy, justice, but beneficent, non-maleficence. So if the review form is filled up, you are not going to miss a point because otherwise natural human tendency is that we'll forget at that point when we are seeing which point we have seen, which point we have not seen. 
So the review form should follow the checklist given in the ICMR guidelines. Accordingly, you will have to prepare it. The committee can also have subcommittees, uh, which can be part of the, which have to be part of the main committee. So you can have an expedited review committee separately. You can have an SAE subcommittee. And these committees, of course, have to report to the, the full board. Their report will go to the final committee. As I said, that continuing oversight is a responsibility of EC. So you'll have to continuously review the ongoing process. And in the probes, you have to see that, is there any change in the informed consent required? Whether any amendments have been made? What are the safety updates? And till the completion report and the publication. Now, site monitoring is another responsibility given to the ethics committees. We have a separate SOP for site monitoring. It can be for cause, where somebody has given a complaint, or it can be a routine monitoring. If the committee feels that something they are not happy about some project which they think that may not be done properly, the consent process, they can go and do a check also. So site monitoring, there are interesting papers come from KEM Hospital Mumbai where they do regular, where the ethics committee does regular site monitoring. It's interesting to read those papers. Please read it to understand. Or the OHRP in US gives a continuous uh, reporting of the site monitoring which they have done and what are the problems which they found out. To read that, you will know that what are the mistakes which should not be done by an ethics committee. Now, as a member, when we come to the competence of members, of course, the members have to know the science, the ethics, the social issues, legal issues, the regulatory issues, the basic human rights issues. But what is more important, there are many people, you know, it is a permanent problem which we face, people keep asking questions. I have done the training of the NIH which is conducting. I have done the city training. I have done the international training. Why should we do any other training? Isn't that enough for us to get DHR registration? Now, what is there, which I insist, I tell everybody that, that it's very good to have all international training. We have nothing against it. They are very good. Of course, they're very advanced. We have, all of us have done, gone through all those trainings. But what is more important is the ethics committees in India is to know that our own guidelines and our own rules, which is at the moment the ICMR guidelines and the NDCT rules. So if they, you have a training, you attended a training, maybe 10 trainings, which have not touched upon the ICMR guidelines or the NDCT rules, then how good you can be an ethics committee of an institute within the country and you will do it properly. And that's where I'm insisting. I've been telling Dr. Roli to tell the DHR officials since Madam uh, Nagar is there. I would like to say that we have to insist that the basic training should be on three things. One is the ICMR guideline, the NDCT rules, and third is the roles and responsibilities of ethics committees, so that the members are very clear what they should do and what they should not do. That's all, that's the minimum requirement. More than that, you can do any amount of uh, training, that's fine. And this training has to be a continuous process. We have to keep on updating ourselves because guidelines keep changing all the time. The rules may also change. So we have to, and then there are a lot of new emerging issues about which the members may not be aware. And so we have to have a continuous training which has been done. Other than that, of course, the members can do, get their diplomas and degrees and there are interesting books, interesting movies, ethics-based movies. You can see all those things to, you know, equip yourself with what is happening globally. Now, registration, go, we are going to hear details from Balu and, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, other person from the DHR. But you all should, I am sure all of you know that we started registration in 2013 under CDSU. It's not something new. The DHR registration has started after the NDCT rules in September 2019. And still, there are many, majority of the institutions in the country are not registered. We have only few. I understand, of course, many are in the process because the committees are not properly constituted. They don't have proper SOPs. The members have not undergone training as a result. Many things are pending, but still a country like this, which has thousands of institutions doing research and having ethics committees, everybody in the last three years are over and we have very few which are registered. Now, what is more important is that it's not necessary an ethics committee members are trained. We do quality uh, review. The quality has to be assured and the quality means it has to undergo further improvement. And that's why we talk of not just registration. Registration will give only the structure and your basic, uh, whether you are properly able to function. But actually your way of functioning is assessed by accreditation. 
and the accreditation we have very few programs in the globally also in india we have uh, three one is the nabh accreditation this is done for cdsco registered uh, ethics committees they go for nabh accreditation this is only for those which do regulatory clinical trials not for others the sitka recognition which we are doing under for cap and for c unfortunately in spite of our best efforts we have only 17 in this country i'm i'm so happy that the nirt is in the icmr was the first institute to undergo sitka recognition then we have nae chennai both the chennai institutes are doing excellent work the following they have been reviewed not once twice thrice and they are maintaining a standard and third is the national institute of reproductive and child health mumbai apart from these three all the other we have 28 icmr institutes uh, only other rest of them have not come forward to do this because you will understand that when you go through these processes your functioning is tuned very well so that you become an internationally acceptable ethics committee which nirt nae and nir and ch are able to do there are also some international american accreditation which only of course three in the country have that now all of you heard about the covid guidelines and the covid guidelines were made as you see that mainly for ethics committees only because ethics committees were flooded with proposals and they were struggling what to do so we learned how to do expedious review not just expedited review expedious review is fast track review we allowed the various methods of doing informed consent you are asking about e consent it was all allowed and then we we also said how it can be done we adopted so many new technologies with all these new kind of uh, web platform coming up and uh, so the ecs have played a valuable role we have you saw that uh, the cechr turnover time is 24 to 72 hours i'm sure many other committees have also done that of course as far as multi centric anyway dr roli is going to speak and we can have some uh, question answer session at that time who has come out with lot of guidelines so you can go through that in fact we were part of the first guideline in who 2000 itself so if to just to conclude ethics committee is a conscience keeper of the society it has no vested interest its main responsibility is to protect the right safety and well being of the research participants and to ensure credibility of the data and integrity if the research is good then your data is also good ethics committee is a friend to the researcher it's not an enemy many people think ethics committee is an enemy because they are asking too many questions ethics committee is actually a friend because by asking questions you are educating the researchers to do it in the right way and the ec members have a specific role and they should be aware of their roles and responsibilities the quality review is important so that the continuous monitoring have to be done and the most important is the continuous capacity building and the knowledge update for the ethics committee members because since you are giving the entire responsibility to them unless they are aware of the latest you can't expect a quality review from them so thank you all for the patient hearing any questions i can take up now or through the chat box thank you so much yes, ma'am uh, for this uh, excellent talk and uh, i think we can take one or two questions and then move on uh, so i see one question in the chat box is it all right if an ethics committee adopts another institution's sop which have been put up in the public domain with suitable modifications giving due credit to the source so the whole uh, we have been asking all the ethics committees to put their sops in the website so that anybody can download but that doesn't mean okay. you can simply Based download a, a, i sorry that doesn't mean you can simply uh, download and adopt it because you have to see what is your way of functioning how do you want to function see they may say that we have there are institutions where there are two or three four ethics committees also so they may have an sop which says that four ethics committees how the projects are distributed are two ethics committees you may have only one so what people do is blindly download and simply change the name of their uh, institution and put their own names without realizing does it suit your uh, your requirements so you can download it because that's why they have put it in the website you download it go through the entire sop make necessary changes wherever you think will suit you and then of course give due credit to the original sops from where they have done it 
But if you simply adopt it, I'm sure there will be a lot of mistakes will be there because everybody, every committee has its own way of functioning. Because we have been doing Sitka recognition for so many countries, not only in so many institutes, not only in India, even internationally, we have done in many countries. No, no two ethics committees have the same way of functioning. Yes, so there's nothing wrong in downloading, but please see that it suits your purpose and do the necessary changes. Give due credit to them. That's all. Ma'am, yes. there is a question from Dr. Divya and she's asking, can we have a format for standard approval letter? Oh, oh no, sorry. That was a question by Jaspreet Kaur. And there's another question that uh, about the, yeah, from Dr. Divya. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> about standardized consent form. So there are two questions, standardized consent form and standardized approval letter. Would you like See, to? Yeah, yeah. you can. We do, we do have... Uh, if you go to the FARSI website, I, I don't know whether it is uh, they are recently updated, or any of the international ones, or even our own institutions. For example, yeah, you take NIRT, NAE. I told you they are internationally recognized institutions. Just go to their site, see what is the kind of a consent form and what is the kind of a approval letter they put up in their website. Okay. Just see that. Because this they there says almost you can say perfect way of doing it so you can look at it you can adopt it okay and whenever you have of course as we are going to come out in the common forms which roli was referring there are many things which are given which can be used by people so you can have it and we'll also try to see because in the changes which are going to do with coming out with the new sops the sops will have their own annexures where all these sample forms will be given I think the revised one will be out very soon and you are you will going to have a modified one. But at the moment, there are plenty of them are available. Go through these recognized institutions website and see that what is it they are using that will going to be very helpful for you. Namaste, ma'am. Dr. Narendran from ICMR NIRT, ma'am. Yes. It was yes, very ma nice to hear oh. you directly from the Encyclopedia of Ethics. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, thank you for, uh, to Roli, ma'am, also for uh, the and NCDER for organizing thing. Ma'am, one question with regard to the subcommittee. Yeah. Is there any quorum for the subcommittee and how is it linked with the main committee or is it totally detached from the main committee? Because now with too many proposals rushing in, it's always good to have a subcommittee. But See, once you say subcommittee, subcommittee means it has to be only part of a full committee. A yes, subcommittee cannot be independent, okay? Subcommittee has to be part of a full committee only as far as the members of subcommittee are concerned. But even in that subcommittee, you can invite subject experts. There's no objection to that. Okay. Yes. But is but there any, thing, yeah. Any, yeah. any minimum number or any, any quorum that has to be fulfilled for the subcommittee anyway, also? The same, same thing is that quorum will be there. Anyway, the quorum we say is five members. Okay. Yes. That's all. Thank you, ma'am. ICMR guideline says only five members quorum. In that, of course, you can't have all five from the institution. There has to be at least one outsider. Okay, those things you have to follow as far as the quorum. See, that's why we have simplified the quorum. We have not made it very difficult. So you have to have minimum five members. At least one person should be non-affiliated. Uh, so these things you will have to follow. Thank you, ma'am. See, you can have subcommittees when you, the, the question you are telling is proposals are pouring in. So you will have a subcommittee that cannot be a subcommittee. Okay. Subcommittees are your expedited review committee or the SAE subcommittees. The others can be for easy functioning. You can make small committees look into the proposal first, give their, uh, you know, recommendations so that when you have a full board, it becomes easier. It is only your way of functioning, but then in that case, you have to make a slight change in your SOP that you are going to make that com such committees to examine the proposals. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Madam, can I ask a question, please? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, I'm Dr. Dev Kumar from uh, NIN, Hyderabad. Yes. Uh, so, uh, good morning, madam, and good morning, Dr. Roli, as well as Dr. Prashant. Yeah. So, madam, this uh, is a very uh, generalized question. Uh, is there any number of proposals, I mean, a cutoff number, which you are supposed to consider in one sitting? And 
what is the uh, sitting fees that is decided as per icmr guidelines for each member these are two points i wanted to know you see as far as the number of proposal is concerned we have not kept any number okay it all depends upon the committee the committee has to decide on a particular day particular day what is the duration of your meeting within the duration how many you can do justice proposals not just simply passing them away okay so that icmr cannot put any number because icmr is giving a general guidelines each is there are institutions where there can be only two or three proposals and there are institutions like nart and others where whole day also we can't finish their proposals because the number is so much so it all depends upon the committee to decide you have a one day meeting you have a two day meetings so you can split that into two two so all those things you can decide okay as far as the payment is concerned we have not fixed any payment icmr means i see we will have to go by the icmr rules what icmr says for any committee member what should be the honorarium to be paid icmr decides as far as the private institutions are concerned they decide on the basis of what they want to give so here these are amounts which are, you know you cannot fix it you have to go to the icmr headquarters and ask what is the amount they are fixing up for giving to the members uh dr roli you have any idea dr roli 4000 have always a confusion with 4000 and 5000 madam so that's why we yeah. end up making wagging yes. our brains yes we are going by the icmr rules and accordingly the payments are being made to the non icmr affiliated external members of the ethics committee so actually so it, every institution would follow their own norms i mean icmr institutes would follow the icmr norms and similarly other medical colleges and other research institutions would fo follow their own norms for payment of honorarium so uh, for the uh, purpose of clarity is it 4000 or 5000 uh, just a small uh, if you have any idea if you go through the icmr guidelines it is 4000 okay so, right. but if you want to change it you need to go through the process and get the necessary approvals so otherwise it is 4000 as of right. now i think yeah. most of the icmr institutes pay 4000 yeah, unless the change okay. is made at the headquarters level okay we are we are following 4000 yeah right thank you very much so ma'am i have one more query like so uh this is regarding like uh, in any project there could be leftover samples so can we include a statement in the consent form that the leftover sample will be used for any future project and uh, although the future project is not clear at that particular time point see this is why like, did you attend any training program so far yeah yeah i had yeah. attended uh, so if that these are the details which are told in the training program trainings there yeah as to samples any samples left over you have to if you take samples in any study you have to make a statement are you going to destroy the samples at the end of the study or are you going to store it okay if you are going to store it you have to take a consent from them there are three different consents are given in the icmr guidelines go through that okay the for the individual to decide they can say that uh, i don't give consent they can say yes We, I can give consent, provided you come back to me. They can also say if an ethics committee approves, that's fine. I can give consent. Okay. So yeah. these are all already given in the ICMR guidelines in details. Please go through the guidelines. Please attend proper training programs. There are many ICMR institutes who have attended the NIH and other training programs, but they have not attended the training program on ICMR guidelines, and that's the whole problem. Yeah. Fine. Uh, morning ma'am i am dr anjali sharma from jaipur i yeah. just wanted to ask you is it mandatory for a basic scientist member of ethics committee to be a pharmacologist see that is only for regulatory trial only hmm. for the regulatory trial where you need approval of cdsco there the basic scientist has to be pharmacologist uh -huh. so for all other committees it can be any basic scientist why a pharmacologist only okay okay anybody can be there yeah thank you thank you all for your uh, very nice questions i will also try to reply some of the remaining in the chat box uh, we it's time to move on now so thank you ma'am so much for uh, for taking this excellent session and uh, highlighting the important uh, role that ethics committee members have to play in safeguarding the right safety and well-being of 
uh, human participants. And uh, now we have with us uh, Dr. Sujata Sinha, who is working as Scientist D at the Department of Health Research in the National Ethics Committee Registry for Biomedical and Health Research. And she's, the key, she's keenly involved in reviewing all the applications that are being reviewed at DHR for registration of ethics committee. And we have requested her to discuss the key highlights related to the EC registration process on the NATIC portal. So thank you, Dr. Sujata, and I hand it over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. Today I will be speaking on how to get your EC registered with DHR on NATIC portal. But before that, I would thank our scientific advisory, Dr. Roli Mathur for giving us this opportunity as we are from registry and we like to disseminate and try to do outreach to various stakeholders. And this is a great platform for us where various ICMR and non-ICMR institutes have joined this program. And I would also thank our designated authority, Ms. Anu Nagar, under her leadership, the registry is working successfully from last 2.5 years. And she always emphasizes on uh, simplification of process for all the users and insists on reducing regulatory compliance burden. And first for us, every uh, day is a great learning experience with ma'am. So with this thank you note, I would start my presentation. So EC registry has been set up in DHR for facilitating this process and application are submitted on the NAPIC portal. This entire process is completely paperless. You don't need to submit any hard copies at any stage of the registration. And uh, certificates are also issued in the online mode. User can download it from their account. List of all ethics committees are also given on um, uh, DHR website. And frequently asked question and guidelines have also been put there. We also post recent notification from time to time. <clears throat> so registration of ethics committee from DHR is a two-step process. First, you have to get login registration approval, and then you can apply in CT0 form along with list of document given in table one of third schedule of uh, NDCT 2019. From 6th October 2021, e-hastakshar has replaced the need for submission of hard copies. So you have to get one username and password for login registration approval. Username can be any valid email ID, but it is advisable that this email ID should be created specifically for institutional ethics committee. Uh, it should not be of anyone's personal. And after that, you can do the profile completion here, uh, you need to fill the applicant details and uh, as an ID proof PAN card or Aadhaar card can be uploaded, then you need to fill organizational detail and organizational address proof can also be uploaded there. And then you need to fill member secretary details. <laughs> Once profile completion is done, you get a, an email with a link and you can download your auto-generated undertaking you can check your undertaking whether it is correct or not. If it is not correct, you can go back and edit it. And if it is correct, you can proceed for e hastakshar verification. Before that, a consent will be taken from you, whether you are uh, willing to share your mobile number or uh, OTP, which is received on that mobile number, which is linked to your Aadhaar card. <clears throat> so once you agree on this, you will be directed to a page where you need to fill all these details and then successful submission happens. You will get a message for successful submission on your dashboard and then your login registration is with DHR for further processing and then whether it will be approved or rejected. <clears throat> if it will be rejected, you will get to know the reason because the reason will be mentioned in the email. And if it is approved, you can start applying in CT01 form along with table one documents, which is basically a list of SOPs which needs to be uploaded. And then you can fill details like name of ethics committee, authority, and authority under which this institutional ethics committee is being uh, formed. 
and then address of the ethics committee can also be filled there then you have, you need to fill all the member details and supporting staff details and then you also need to give audit details of uh, ethics committee <laughs> Uh, you can, uh, the uploaded CV should be uh, self-attested and updated and a format has been given on NATIC portal for this purpose. Applicant, uh, ref, applicant can refer this uh, format for uploading their CV and uh, it is mandatory that EC experience should be mentioned in chairperson CV. And apart from seven regular roles, Natic portal, Natic portal has options like you can indicate dual role, alternate member secretary, member, scientific member, and alternate member. Once this is completed, you can check your EC if it is a balanced one on these given parameters. And then if 50% of members are non-affiliate, if it is if your EC is multidisciplinary or multi-sectoral in nature, or is there adequate representation of age and gender in your EC? So once it is done, you need to upload one undertaking, which is auto-generated from our portal, and it should be signed by member secretary and chairperson both, which contain following points like uh, committee shall review and accord its approval to biomedical research and will also carry ongoing review according to national ethical guideline. If serious adverse events are reported, the committee will uh, analyze and forward its opinion, opinion to appropriate authority then committee shall allow expert official authorized by DHR to inspect any record data or any document. And if you, you have to produce any document if asked, and then adequate and accurate record will be maintained for at least three years after completion of study, both in hard copies and soft copies. So your dashboard will look like this. If the uh, submitted application will land into submitted tab, you can check it from there. If it is not, filled completely, it can be saved as draft. And the new application can also be uh, started from submit form section. If final certificate has been approved for your EC, then it will land in approved section. And if query is raised, you can uh, see it in query raised section. So once you click on application, you can check the status of your application also. So when a query is raised from DHR, if your document is not there and if your document is not complete, if your document is not correct, and if your documents are not in line of national ethical guideline, and also if you have requested for change in membership composition to DHR. So you can download your provisional certificate, which is uh, valid for two years from your account. You will get an email, email alert for this purpose. And the, you can also check your name uh, in the list of EC registered from DHR on NATIC portal. So final certificate is given in CT03 format along with list of members and also a covering letter along with condition of registration is also given with this uh, certificate. And this is valid for five years from date of issue. So you can call us, you can mail us if you face any problem and we are happy to help. Uh, I would like to invite question regarding uh, registration process problem. Thank you. Well, okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sujata, for uh, that excellent talk. And I'm I'm sure there would be some questions. Um, let me see the chat. Okay. So uh, there is a question that what is the procedure of intimating change in membership after ethics committee registration? Is there a provision online? Would you like to take that question, Dr. Sujata? Uh, you can inform us through email uh, about your change in membership composition, and then we raise a query accordingly, and then you can add your members there on the portal. Okay, so it is there in the portal or yes. otherwise they can write an email to you? Uh, first, they should start because how we, we would come to know that they want to change their members. Okay. Okay. What is the validity of registration? Two years for provisional certificate from date of issue and five years for final certificate from date of issue. So the initial registration, which is provisional, is for two years and then you get a registration final for year. five years. Okay. 
uh, how long will it take from the provisional certificate to get the final certificate? It is within two years, but we try to raise query as soon as possible. So maybe you will, you can get it in three months or maybe in six months or maybe in one year and maybe you can, you can get it immediately also. So there is no time limit for that, but it is within two years before that you will get, if there is any query, otherwise you will get directly final certificate. So regarding the back date, I know it cannot be done. <laughs> back date is not possible. Uh, there is one question, but I think that would be better answered by Dr. Muthuswamy, and that is about the lay person, only literate is written. So can we take 10th pass person? Ma'am, would you like to reply to that question, Dr. Muthuswamy? Or otherwise, I'll take it. Oh, ma'am is here. Yes. I am here only. <laughs> no. See, if you look at the guideline, it is written there. I'll just... A lay person means, you see, it's not an illiterate person. Okay, a lay person is a literate person. Only thing is they are not associated with the medical field. At least in the last five years, they have not done that. So it's better it should be an educated person. The whole idea is they should be able to understand, read the project, understand the project, what it is going to be done, read the patient information sheet and the informed consent to understand it has been done properly. The translations are done properly from English to whatever is a local language. So it's not that, you know, 10th pass lay person means somebody who is an illiterate person. Please don't think that. Lay person is a literate lay person who can understand all those things. So if you are confident a 10th pass person will be so good to understand the English translations as well as the science behind it, you can select that person. Otherwise, you know, you'll have to see a lay person as, I know in one committee in Chennai, the retired the chief secretary of Tamil Nadu is the lay person. <laughs> okay. So you can imagine the highest level of education is the chief secretary of the Tamil Nadu government and uh, is the lay person of that particular committee. So what do you understand? Please remember a lay person has to be a literate person. Only thing is they're lay from the medical field so that whatever is written by the scientist and told that which they can uh, We'll try to understand and relate it to the common people. Yes, Roli, if you want to add anything, you can add. Yeah, so the person should be uh, able to read the protocols, understand the kind of research. He or she has to represent the community values, the patients, the public. So if he's aware, socially aware, uh, he's literate, 10th class is, of course, literate. So we need people, you know, it's not like that anybody should be becoming a member of ethics committee. It should be people who have interest, who are, uh, you know, uh, willing to take up the rights of the patients, to be the voice of the public on the ethics committee. Uh, so we have to find people who are devoted to this cause and, you know, who will be able to raise voice and not be subdued by the other clinical members and many ethics committees. There are more clinicians and the lay, uh, we have done surveys uh, in many uh, countries actually, including India. And what we found is sometimes the non-medical members are also the non-vocal members of the ethics committee. And that totally defeats the purpose of an ethics committee. We need people who will be able to raise the voice, be vocal about it. So I think that is the main criteria for uh, the lay person. If you see the SMR guideline, the first sentence for a lay person is, it should be a literate person from the community or society. That's all. Okay. So person should be an educated person. The whole purpose is, for them to understand the, the sign protocol, understand the consent form. So will a 10th pass or an 8th pass will be able to do that is the question. If they can do that, that's fine. So th that's your purpose is done. Okay. So many places people think that lay person means somebody who doesn't know anything else to be a member of the committee. It's not that. Somebody who can understand everything. Only thing is they are not connected with the medical field so that, you know, they are looking at it from a common man's perspective. A patient, a patient doesn't know anything about medicine or science. So they are representing them. So they don't understand the medicine, whether they can understand it. They can understand it. Then the consent form will be easy enough for the participant to understand. That's the whole purpose. 
गुड गुड मॉर्निंग मैम आई हैव अ क्वेश्चन मैम सॉरी फॉर माय बैड थ्रोट मैम आई हैव अ क्वेश्चन दैट आई हैव पुट द क्वेश्चन रिगार्डिंग द बैक डेट बिकॉज़ मेनी अ टाइम्स लाइक मेंबर्स ऑफ द मेंबर्स सेक्रेटरी फॉरगेट्स दैट रजिस्ट्रेशन हैज एक्सपायर्ड एंड हाउ टू फिल दैट गैप इफ ही रिमेंबर्स इट आफ्टर 2 मंथ्स और 3 मंथ्स लाइक व्हाट इज द रूल फॉर दैट हु इज आस्किंग दिस मैम डॉक्टर कमलेश from okay. savdajing hospital dr kamlesh if you have forgotten to re-register after 2 months you realize you are registering those 2 months any meeting of your ethics committee held is invalid that minutes cannot be accepted because you have an unregistered committee now okay so one has to be aware in 3 months 4 months 6 months in advance whatever they are telling in dhr just see when you have to reapply you have to apply for it there's no excuse that somebody has forgotten and two months after so much you realize those two months your committee is an invalid committee according to me you should not uh, you know anything decision taken during that period is not valid no sponsor will accept it okay and ma'am is Madam. there any uh, is there any provision for the reminders or notifications like prior to when the uh, registration is going to expire is there some provision no, no, like about your own committee you want poor dhr to send you the uh, reminder to thousands of committees <laughs> madam just i want to ask one question huh? that is suppose two years for the provisional is over so can we take extension from the from what extension after two years you have to apply for reapply and get the five year period no what what is extension you want suppose by chance we will not get the five years uh, registration that i think uh, dhr people have to answer i can i don't know. okay balu or sujata uh, madam uh, one question uh, for example um, in uh, in the animal ethics committee i am just quoting an example madam wherein apart from the main nominees or whatever it is lay lay persons uh, presence is mandatory for every meeting madam likewise is there a similar this thing even for our iec yes if you is see the quorum without which the, the, the meeting is valid. if you see the quorum for the committee okay, okay which should be present that's right. why i said that your approval letter also should mention the quorum what does right. the quorum say the quorum in the as per the, of course regulatory it's a must that everybody has to be there and icmr as i said it's been little lenient in the sense it is written preferably but it should not be i think when the next revision is made i'll make rolly make it compulsory the lay person should be there okay so as per the quorum lay person should be there and if there that means it's a, it's mandatory i'm just one question this is dr siddharth giri from rmrc bhubneshwar uh, so uh, madam you mentioned about the vice chair person of a ethics committee so during registration uh, should we mention is it supposed to be a constant person or it, can it vary from meeting to meeting if the chair person is not available you see then you don't call them vice chair person no a vice chair person is somebody whom you have already decided in the beginning okay. that this is the chair this is the vice chair and whenever chair is not there vice chair will take over if you don't okay. have a vice chair it's okay many committees don't have then on that particular day you choose somebody they are called the alternate chair person right ma'am thank you don't call call them vice chair okay the vice right, chair is somebody which is decided in the beginning itself thank you so much ma'am ma'am this is from rsc Yes, this please. is from RIC, Dr. Shubhangi Pingle. I just wanted to ask one question to Sujata, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, yes, applicant ma in DHR, applicant yes. is in DHR is head of the institute or only member secretary should apply? Uh, ma'am, nowadays only head of the institute can apply. Okay. Or any person okay. authorized, any person authorized by head of the institute. Okay. And then Aadhar card and all details has to upload. Upload. of the directors only right ma'am yes ma'am if he or she is the applicant and secondly ma'am uh, all members we have taken external but can uh, to make bigger committee and to fulfill the quorum can we have some basic scientist and uh, doctors from our uh, institute internal member in icmr guideline we said only 50% should be outside 
Okay, fifty percent can be from institute. We have given you that provision. Why you are having all right. external members? We have not said that everybody should be external. That's why we have given you the provision that at least fifty percent should be external. Okay. Regarding gender, ma'am, we must uh, have internal members also. Otherwise, the committee is, will be a very skewed committee. Yeah, yeah. See, it's a regulatory committee. I understand because there they are insisting there will be more non. And even there also they think. Uh, they have given, I think, fifty percent. But uh, regarding gender, ma'am, fifty percent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right, ma'am. So you can regarding say, gender. Regarding gender, is there is any proportion? It should be balanced. We okay. have mentioned uh, in national ethical guideline. It is mentioned that it should be balanced. So you can I mean, figure out can from fix, that. Yeah, you can't fix the number, no. It has okay. to be balanced because it cannot be nowadays. It's mostly all women and no man. Usually, all committees used to have all men and no women. Now, mm -hmm. the ethics committee is mostly all women and no man. It cannot be that both men and women should be there. It's not you cannot to do the fixed number because it depends on the availability of members. No, you cannot fix all these numbers. Right, ma'am. Regarding audit details, ma'am, I have not understood this point. Dr. Balu has replied to that in the message. Ma'am, you can upload any audit details if your uh, EC has been audited ever. Then you can upload that details. Yeah. Ma uh, ask one question, I think we have to now move on to the next session and uh, I think uh, I'll request all the audience here to please go through guidelines. Some of the things are there in the guidelines and uh, so it, I will try to also reply to your chat boxes thing but uh, these are a lot of details are there in the guidelines and please write the email to us because if we are not able to answer to you today please just send us an email we'll send you a detailed reply with the clause where all this information can be located easily okay so in the interest of time i will uh, now like to thank dr sujata for her talk and uh, invite dr balu uh, for the next talk and uh, so this is on standard operating procedures and communications of the ethics committee uh, by Dr. Balu is uh, formerly he was working at ICMR bioethics unit here in Bangalore, but now he's a scientist C at the Department of Health Research in the National Ethics Committee Registry for Biomedical Health Research and uh, playing an important role there. So welcome Dr. Balu and I hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Hope I'm audible to everyone. And <laughs> So I will start directly with my presentation, but I think before that I will take three questions which was asked earlier. One is regarding the head of the institute. So we had currently restricted the login registration to head of the institute or any person authorized by the head of the institute who belongs to that particular category. It may be the dean, it may be the director, it may be the CEO. So it should be a person at the head of the institute category who should be acting as the appellate authority or the applicant. Next question is regarding if the provisional expires and the final has not been issued in case if the ethics committee forgets to re-register. So what method we follow is before almost three to four months before your provisional expires, we again risk query on your applications for you to update because there may be a change in members. There may be change in oh, documents. You might have updated your SOP. So three to four months before your uh, provisional is expired, we raise query on your application. And an intimation on the same will be sent to your registered email ID. So I humbly request everyone to keep a watch on your email ID because many of them creates a specific email ID for the ethics committee. And then we even get communications that we forgot the password. We don't remember our uh, username that created so always keep a watch on your email id so that our communications will never get missed third thing is regarding the audit details 
So the audit details, we are just asking you whether your ethics committee is previously audited by any regulator or any third party or self audit by the institutional ethics committee. You can provide the details if it is audited. If not, you can give a justification that mo most of them give us a justification that it is a newly created ethics committee. So we haven't gone for the process of audit. So hope I cleared the doubts of the previous queries. And now I'll quickly move to my presentation, which is on standard operating procedures and communications of the EC. I have placed a never to miss slide on my, uh, on my slide. This is the basic principles of biomedical health research, which every ethics committee meeting will have a slide on the same. I'm just moving on to my next slide. So I'll start with an overview of ethics committees. So as I mentioned, an ethics committee will always have an appellate authority who will be authorizing or constituting the ethics committee under his authority. And this appellate authority should not be part of the EC to ensure the independent functioning of the EC. And he should be acting just as the appellate authority and not intervening in the decision making of the ethics committee. A typical ethics committee, according to ICMR guidelines, will have seven to 15 members. It is a properly constituted body mandated with the responsibility of both ethical and scientific re review. Vasanda ma'am emphasized this ethical and scientific review, responsibly deliberated and capable of independent decision making. And I mentioned here properly constituted. What are the mandates for ethical and scientific review? How do we ensure responsible deliberations? So this indicates that there are some guiding principles that help the ethics committee to perform its functions. These guiding principles or guidance documents that help the ethics committee is called standard operating procedures. And we could say that the ethics committees derive its validity from the standard operating procedures. And these standard operating procedures in turn derive their validity from ICMR guidelines, new drugs and clinical trial rules 2019, the ICS GCP guidelines in line with or merging these guidelines with the purpose, scope and institutional policies make your specific institutional SOP. Here we can decide. So I mentioned responsibly deliberated. Now these responsible deliberations made by the ethics committee have to be effectively communicated to the concerned person for ensuring a responsibly conducted research. And ensuring this responsible conduct of research would be the successful outcome of having an ethics committee in your institution. We'll move on to the next slide of standard operating procedures. So it is a detailed written instruction in a certain specific format, describing all activities and actions undertaken by the organization to achieve uniformity in performance in their functions. So having an SOP will ensure in having a quality system in place it provides information on how to perform your job and to clearly communicate the process of your business in this case is the ethics committee functioning and it should be specific and customized to the institutional requirements. It should be written in a concise step by step easy to read format information in the SOP should be unambiguous not to be redundant not to be over lengthy it should be kept simple and short. All the information conveyed in the SOP should be clear and explicit. So there should be no doubt of in any process of the ethics committee, which is mentioned in the SOP. Whenever possible, you can always use a flowchart that will illustrate the process being described. Uh, I have not given a title for this slide. I have just copy pasted a line, which is an SOP for SOP. So when you have an SOP bundle for your ethics committee functions, the first SOP should always be an SOP on how to write, review, and amend your SOPs for the ethics committee. Every ethics should have a written SOP according to which the ethics committee should function. And you can always refer to ICMR national ethical guidelines and other regulatory documents in preparing your SOPs. The SOP should be updated periodically, and the latest version of the SOP should be made available in the secretariat at the ethics committee office and with the all and with all the members of the ethics committee. And also you have to ensure that the ethics committee members and the secretariat is trained in the SOPs. So this is a picture which I was able to download from the internet, which clearly summarizes how to draft an SOP. You decide your scope and purpose, collect the necessary information, choose a format and type of SOP, draft your SOP, review and redraft, maybe review and redraft again, publish it, implement it, ensure that all the staffs are trained on your SOPs. 
Now on drafting an SOP, always an ethics committee can have an SOP team, which is also mentioned in ICMR guidelines. An SOP team can be constituted from the member secretary and one or two other members in the ethics committee along with the secretariat. They would be mandated with the responsibility of drafting, reviewing, and proposing amendments for the ethics committee. The chairperson will be approving the ethics committee, signs and dates the uh, approving the SOPs and signs and dates the SOP from the date from which it is implemented. Another, import, another important thing which needs the emphasis is the format and layout of the SOPs. SOP should be properly numbered with a self-explanatory title. So we know that for an ethics committee, there are multiple SOPs. Each SOP should be properly numbered and they should have a self-explanatory title and the unique format of numbering. I have given an example, which is SOP XX slash VY. XX refers to the number given and VY refers to the version of that particular SOP. For an example, you can say SOP 05 version two. This is the second version of the fifth SOP in your ethics committee SOP bundle. There will be multiple annexures for each SOPs also, and these annexures can also be numbered. In a specific format, I have given a random example. It is ANXX of SOP5 version 2. So AXX can be referred to the annexure number. AN01 is the first annexure of SOP5. The effective date of the approval from which the SOP was implemented and the date of next review, the date till the SOP is valid after that this SOP will be again reviewed for any updation at that point of time should be mentioned in the SOP. The first page of each SOP document will be signed and dated by the authors uh, who has drafted the SOP, who has reviewed the SOP and finally the signature of the chairperson who has approved the SOP. Coming to uh, the SOPs that is sought for registration at National Ethics Committee registry, basically you can divide the SOPs to two uh, categories. One, um, few are the SOPs that is associated with the constitution and roles and responsibilities. It includes the membership requirements of ethics committees, the terms and reference of the ethics committee and ethics committee members, the conditions of appointment and the quorum requirements as per ICMR guidelines, and the procedure for resignation, replacement, and removal. Other general SOPs, but very important SOPs that is required for the functioning of ethics committees include the policy for uh, training of the ethics committee members and the role of the institute in ensuring this training. The second one is the policy for handling conflict of interest. The third one is policy for reviewing vulnerable population studies. And the fourth one is a general SOP, which gives an overview of the entire functioning of your ethics committee. If you want to look into SOPs that are required for the proper functioning of an ethics committee, you can look into page number 160, 160 of ICMR National Ethical Guidelines, where they have listed 28 number of SOPs that is required for the functioning of ethics committee and Rolly ma'am recently mentioned uh, in the previous talk, she mentioned that they are going to reduce the number of SOPs and hopefully uh, soon we might see a new format for the, I mean, minimized SOP format online. And now I will move on to ethics committee related communications. So I'll start from uh, the first slide, which is which we stopped at responsible deliberations that is made by the ethics committees. So the response, the deliberations that is made by the ethics committees makes meaning only when they are effectively communicated to the concerned person in most case, which is a principal investigator who has submitted the proposal for the study, ensuring a responsible conduct of the research. So an EC always have to focus on two things which is maximizing the benefits and minimizing the risk to the participants. And both this can be achieved only by providing reasonable ethical and scientific inputs and communicating these specifically to the principal investigator. So I have just summarized the types of communications that uh, will happen within an EC. One would be with the appellate authority. The other would be within the EC members. The third type of communication is with the principal investigator. And that would be the major communication happening within the EC. And the fourth one is a communication with the regulator. So I'll be focusing on the later two, the communication with the PA and the communication with the regulator. And uh, what would be the outcome of effective communications with the EC and with the PA? It ensures responsible conduct of the research, which is very important, improving the scientific and ethical standards of research and ensuring effective administrational control. 
so uh, in general this is in completely in general what uh, what is in general happens between the communication between ethics committees and the pis we can uh, generally classify them into either the study is approved by the ethics committee or the study is rejected by the ethics committee i have used the word rejected just to uh, tell you that it is better not to use the word rejected we can always mention not approved or not recommended not to i mean so keep the motivation of the researchers going on so the point is between the approved and rejection do we have do the ethics committee have a scope for improvisation so ethics committee can always give a lot of binding and non binding informations to the pas that will help them improve the scientific and ethical qualities of the work and these informations has to be communicated to the pa which will help the ethics committee to improve the scientific standards of the country as such so the general decisions made uh, by the ethics committee should either they approve the study or they will forward the study for a minor revision or the study can go for a major modification or resubmissions and in some cases it would be not approved or an existing approval would be revoked or terminated so now i'll just focus on a few of the contents that has to be there in the decision letter that is communicated from the ec to the pi a designated approval number of the ec has to be mentioned in the approval letter the title of the research proposal that is reviewed the name and designation of the pi and the copy i if any the list of documents reviewed bar submitted by the pi very important because based on this document submitted the ethics committee have approved the study so this document has to be listed out and it has to go with the decision uh, letter that is being given to the pi the version number of the protocol approved and the version number of the informed consent approved by the ethics committee the name of the study site and location the list of the ethics committee members who participated in the deliberation and it has to be ensured that the quorum was fulfilled a clear statement on the decision either it is approval revision amendment or a uh, rejection in case of a negative decision it is mandatory that specific reasons has to be clearly stated so that they can further improvise on that a duration can be decided by the ec for continued review of the study and uh, most important thing deliberations means each and every member participated in the ethics committee meeting would have given a constructive criticism or a comment or a recommendation regarding a specific review proposal everything has to be summarized and has to be communicated to the principal investigator allowing them to improvise the study both scientifically and ethically the decision and the approval letters will be signed by the member secretary and the decision letter can be sent along with the approved documents a timeline can also be set by the ethics committee for all kinds of communications once the meeting is over the ethics committee can decide that within 10 days all the communications will be made and the ethics committee can also decide that uh, a timeline for the pis to respond back so it is uh, just an ethics committees can also focus on non binding information it is not necessary that ethics committee should always give binding informations on the ecs they can give simple recommendations simple advices both on scientific and ethical aspects it, it may be on benefit risk ratio privacy confidentiality completely on scientific information additional safeguards or informed consent whatever it is ethics committee is a viewpoint of seven different or 15 different people of 15 different perspectives so that will definitely help the pi to improve his study and improvise the scientific and ethical outcome that comes out of the study uh, another few points to mention is an iec may decide to reverse its positive decision if it has proof to believe that the study has to be uh, now terminated or stopped site visit at the time at ec's discretion may be done ec can always sort additional uh, study related documents for to the pi any amendments any deviations any violations and adverse effects should be communicated at right time to the ethics committees now the communication with the regulator uh, at and this will be in the context of department and department of health research we have always tried to ensure uh, and to reduce the regulatory compliance burden on the ecs all the communications with dhr have been made digital we always emphasize on self assessment self evaluation self audit by institutions and organization as a part of ensuring ease of doing business 
annual reports of the ethics committee functioning should be maintained with the ethics committee proper archiving of meeting minutes decisions with dates and the number of members attended has to be maintained all communication with the ps made should be recorded and archived and we urge that in this uh, scenario we should go for digital archiving at multiple places and we should start moving from manual to digital format and in the digital format please ensure that you save your documents at multiple places so that if even though something happens you have a copy available so ethics committees you are garden you water it you take care of it and we are there to support you <laughs> thank you and a few things i would like to uh, conclude my talk with any of the ethics committee if they are pending to register with uh, department of health research me please expedite and uh, ensure a re registration at the earliest and i would i would like to say that there are number of ethics committees across the country with diverse capacities very new ethics committees starting off and we have very experienced ethics committees also so i would request all the institutions to have a dedicated page for the ethics committees in their website please display your office order a copy of this op and maximum non sensitive information possible let's lead the way forward and let others follow thank you uh, if there are any questions we'll take the questions now or later uh i think you have answered all the questions that was being raised but uh, i don't see any hands up or any further questions so maybe we'll move on and then we'll sure. still have sure. time a bit later for more questions so thank, thank you, you so much dr you, balu for an excellent uh, talk today and we come to my thank colleague you. dr dilip now uh, who who is who is next and who is going to talk to us about the membership and training requirements for ethics committee members dr dilip is uh, has recently joined us uh, as he's a scientist b and working with us at icmr bioethics unit and i'd like to hand it over to you dr dilip thank you dr mathur can i just ask a question dr mathur yes sir yes yeah, sir yeah. this is regarding Uh, the statement that we should not use the word rejected because the uh, the pi may feel insulted or humiliated so can we use the word resubmit with the following amendments resubmit in journals you know when we review the paper in journals we often do that resubmit with the following minor change major change and what changes we expect so instead of approved not approved or resubmit with the following changes third decision Uh, okay so acha dr prashant wants it... to answer yeah. <laughs> oh you know because we want to we want to encourage people doing research na we don't want to discourage them by saying rejected or this not approved resubmit with following suggestion change yes sir. i think your dr anurag shivasta yes yes yeah, namaskar 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 sir <laughs> so you know with all your humbleness you can raise this question <laughs> the point is that you know there are three decisions one is it is actually a rejection so there is no expectation of a resubmission okay second decision is approved that means again there is no resubmission the third category is that there is a revision which is needed and then the person can resubmit after those revisions so the decision has to fall in these three categories okay so one can say not approved hmm. it does not imply that you resubmit it hmm 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 okay it means that uh, and this is not just with ethics this happens with any research project yeah so when you say rejected it, it's a it, it sounds and it hurts very bad it's humiliating it's humiliating yes but the, the uh, better way to say is when you say not approved it means that you are not expecting resubmission of the same project so maybe the pi has to revise based on the comments given and uh, it will be treated as a fresh proposal okay i mean Because i was just thinking you know, may... to encourage to encourage people doing research and improve in their quality 
so i agree with you and i would say, say that uh, you know for a granting agency it's different because for yeah. a grant application you can say not recommended and no further submission yeah. but for an ethics committee the scenario may be different because these may be studies which are scientifically approved and funded or uh, you know so ethics committee i would say has to play a very facilitatory role in yes. the sense yes, that yes, they yes, have yes, to yes. critically examine and give out suggestions not yes. just say rejected or not approved if yeah if you have uh, reasons how the pi should improve i mean i would say that this decision should be bare minimal in uh, ethics committee submission mostly it would be approved or approved with suggestions or revised uh, uh, i would say that yeah thank you dr mathur see i am serving as chairman in ethics committee in nicpr icmr institute in noida so we often do this modify the uh, patient information sheet or in hindi translation correct and then resubmit so next month you know in the next coming up meeting we then say okay the uh, approval the modifications are approved and then okay so yes, we want to encourage I, we want to encourage people yeah, to can i just add something here dr srivastava yes ma'am yes ma see the icmr guidelines yes in the decision process there are four different categories Hmm. one is recommended straight away okay hmm. Hmm. the second is hmm. for resubmit with minor modification yes yes the yes, third yes. Is that's what i mean resubmission with major modification right right the last right. is not recommended generally if you yes. see 99% come under uh-huh. the first three categories absolute thank you thank you anywhere thank where you. we say not recommended or rejected is very rare uh-huh. because it comes thank through you, thank the scientific you. processes it comes through that generally the rejection not recommended by the ethics committee is something which is very rare but that category is there it can happen from the ethical perspective otherwise 99% cases it's in the first three categories so either recommend or minor modification major modification for resubmission okay so it is only you, there that provision it's nothing uh, to be now modified or changed thanks very much ma'am thanks very much thank you Yeah, hand up. Uh, so, Doctor Philip, would you like to ask now, or can we move on to the next, and you can come back later? It's a burning question. You are muted. Uh, previous speaker, so could you please quote any example where uh, this committee has rejected uh, any such uh, proposal? Because the madam has just now mentioned ninety-nine percent of the cases, the first three will be accepted only. They will be like modified reception, so on and so. Forth. Uh, any type of proposal that will go straight away for the rejection? Any one or two examples, ma'am? Uh, you were not very audible, but I heard you. You said that. Can you give any example yes. where uh, a study has been rejected? Yes, yes, ma'am. Would you have an answer to that, Dr. Muthu Swami, please? I don't. Okay, as I that. said, ninety-nine percent don't come yes. under that category. Yes, ma'am. One percent cases it can happen. Yes. Generally, ethics committees don't reject anything. Okay. Yes. they give chance to the investigators to Im- improve the project and resubmit exactly so that provision is still kept because if from the ethical perspective the members feel that it is a ethically very incorrect project which should not be done then only they reject as i said that example is very difficult because generally it's not done but the category is still kept there so that by chance it happens you can still reject it so nobody wants to reject any project yes as dr anurag srivastava said every committee wants to help there that's why he said that ethics committee is not an enemy it's a friend they want you to improve your project improve upon it and resubmit but still this is kept i don't think a committee is where i have been a member for so many years i have ever rejected any project that's why i just asked for any one example because i don't think any such case of Yeah, I am sorry. Thank you so much. So I said I have never rejected. Thanks. <laughs> In the last twenty, thirty years. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. We'll move on to Dr. Dilip now. Who will talk to us about uh, training requirements, uh, briefly about membership also. Yeah, Dr. Dilip. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> okay, I'll be taking on membership and training requirements for ethics committee members.
so i'll be talking about membership and training requirement for ethics committee members and uh, first let's move on to the composition of an ec an ec should be multidisciplinary and multi sectoral as uh, explained by uh, dr vasantha mutsami uh, it should be equitable in distributions like it uh, should not have only scientists or it should not have only doctors everybody should be there and their distribution should be equitable and the uh, ec should represent a good uh, age distribution and gender representation then it is preferable that 50% of the members uh, may be non affiliated and uh, the preferable number of ec members is between 7 to 15 members as per the uh, icmr national ethical guidelines and the quorum re requirement for an ec uh, ethics committee is of five members and let's uh, discuss about the quorum requirement of ec meeting a minimum of five members should be present for the meeting and it should include both medical non medical technical and non technical members and uh, it is preferable that minimum one uh, non affiliated member should be present and a lay person should be present to fulfill the quorum and uh, any decision which is taken without uh, fulfilling the quorum is invalid and uh, let's move on the general requirement for ethics committee members first of all uh, there should be a signed cv most of the time i come across with cvs which are not signed and dated and uh, whenever you are submitting an application to the uh, dhr please make sure that your cv is signed and dated then training certificate should be there and uh, regarding the training certificate i'll <coughs> i'll take on talk about that later then uh, the ec member should be aware of relevant guidelines and regulations and he should follow the conflict of interest policy and should sign the confidential uh, confidentiality and conflict of interest agreement then criteria for the selection of ec members uh, an ec member should be uh, selected based on his or her personal capacity like uh, uh, her qualification her experience should be considered for selection and uh, he he or she should be appointed for a particular role in ec and uh, these criteria for selection should be specified in the sop uh, and coming to the role of chairperson and member secretary these are additional roles with additional responsibilities of an ec member so a basic medical scientist or uh, uh, or sub, uh, or a legal expert can be a chairperson or a secretary these are additional uh, responsibilities for the ec members then training requirement for ethics committee members so the members should be trained in human resource protection ec function and sops and they should be conversant with the national ethical guidelines gcp guidelines and relevant regulations and uh, any uh, ethics committee member uh, they should undergo initial and continuing training and all this training should be recorded and documented then ec members should be aware of the local social and cultural norms and other emerging ethical issues so the training requirement for ethics committee is uh, they should be trained in the indian guidelines and our regulations so the minimum requirement for the training is uh, the the ethics committee members should be trained in icmr national ethical guidelines for biomedical and health research involving human participant 2017 uh, gcp guidelines and new and new drugs and clinical trial rules of 2019 and roles and responsibilities of ecs these are the minimum requirements for uh, minimum training requirements for ethics committee members uh, and uh, moving on uh, the training uh, sessions should be at least for 4 hours and the training should be uh, properly doc documented with the time date and venue then attendance should be recorded and uh, preferably the attendance attendance should be recorded at the beginning and the end of the session and uh, the certificates which is generated after the uh, sessions it should have uh, it should be properly signed it should have the agenda topics covered and the uh, name of the trainers if possible then about the initial training initial training is provided for the newly appointed uh, ec members and they should be trained in icmr national ethical guidelines gcp guidelines and ndct rules roles and responsibilities these are the minimum requirements and also they should be uh, uh, trained in ec submissions review procedures sops and forms of ecs and 
uh, EC members should be trained in the basic minimal research methodologies because uh, uh, there are laypersons, there are lawyers, and uh, other other scientific people. So they should know what all what research they are doing. So basic minimal research methodology they should know. And about informed consent process, training should be given. Then newly appointed EC members uh, uh, may be allowed to sit in an EC meeting so that they can observe how the meeting is going on and they can understand how an EC uh, ethics committee meeting functions. Then regarding the initial training program, uh, the DHR requests that the, uh, the participant should, uh, the EC member should have a training, uh, should undergo training within six months of appointment. If they don't have any certificate initially, they can submit an undertaking and this undertaking should be signed by the member and attested by the head of the institution of the EC. Then uh, regarding the continuing training, uh, is ethics committee training is not a, con uh, is a continuous process. It's not a one-time event. So uh, at the beginning or when the person is enrolled into the EC, they should have an initial training, but they should undergo a continuous training throughout the period in which uh, throughout the period and uh, the EC members should, has the responsibility to keep themselves updated regarding the latest regulations and other guidelines then the EC secretariat has to ensure that all the members uh, receives timely uh, uh, updates and they, uh, they get adequate training uh, through the time then the ethics committee has to conduct uh, workshops and trainings on ethics periodically, preferably once in a an year. And EC has to facilitate researchers to undergo training and education because uh, uh, researchers should understand what ethics committee is expecting from them. So uh, they can mend their research, they can, uh, 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 they can align their proposal according, uh, according to the ethical guidelines. So uh, EC has to uh, give training and education to the researchers also then uh, good communication skill is an integral part of uh, a good EC. Then uh, uh, for EC members who has not yet trained, they can actually uh, enroll to the ethics review for health research course, uh, uh, an initiative from ICMR NIE. And uh, this is an online course. Uh, those members who, ha who has not yet uh, been to any ethics training, you can enroll to this course. And thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Dilip, uh, and uh, for this uh, uh, session. I hope it has clarified some of the doubts about training because that is the crux of the whole issue re these days. And uh, uh, training is extremely important, should be at least annually done. And uh, so if there are any questions to Dr. Dilip, uh, this is the time now. I see one question. What is the role and responsibility of a legal expert in the committee? Any specific expectations from him, her? Yes, of course. Every member of the ethics committee, I think I'll take that question, has a role and responsibility. And if you go to the ICMR guidelines, I'll tell you the page, page number 29. It has discussed about what are the roles. It has actually 28, 29, 30 have discussed the role of each member. And that includes the legal member. The legal member should not be just a sitting member who is just there to fulfill the quorum. He has a very important role in the committee to be updated and to keep the committee updated about the new regulations, laws, framework, national, international, to be talking about, uh, you know, looking at agreements, what kind of study, uh, clin if it's a clinical trial, then clinical trial agreement, if there is insurance, if there are compensation issues, there are a number of regulatory issues that make uh, one come, come across in clinical trial, but also in biomedical and health research. They need to see whether the, uh, you know, the study is in compliance with the Indian requirements, uh, what kind of, for example, if there's transfer of biological material, what kind of material transfer agreement will be there, or if it's a collaborative study, what kind of MOUs are there. So there are specific roles that have been discussed in the guideline about uh, this. And also they must be aware of what committees uh, does the research need approval from depending on the type of research, if it is biotechnology, if it is genetics or stem cell research. So all these additional things, actually the legal expert has a very important role to play in a committee. So, <laughs> okay. 
Uh, Ma'am has raised a very important point in the chat. I'm reading that uh, member secretary, she is saying that we are not sure about the member secretary conducting training for EC members. Ma'am, would you like to elaborate on that point? Yeah, <clears throat> See, the whole purpose of training of EC members is EC members should understand the basics of everything. And if they have a doubt, EC members are very senior persons who are expert in their whole field, who are attending this training program. And if they have any doubt about anything or their practical experience where they need some clarification, then the member secretary will be able to give those explanations. Unless the member secretary, if Dr. Roli Mathur becomes member secretary of a committee, I do understand she can conduct a training program. If Dr. Dilip becomes a member secretary of a committee, I will uh, have my reservation because he's not yet come to that level of experience to give all clarification. Okay, so that's the difference. So it depends on who is a member secretary who's giving training. Just by looking at ICMR guidelines, our NDCT rules, making a slide and presentation is not a training. Okay, training is you have to make people understand and raise their doubts. Question and answer session will be there. If they have some practical question, will the member secretary be able to clarify that? So the member secretary is senior enough and well experienced and become a member secretary for 20 years and they are able to answer, fine, you can conduct it. You cannot make a general statement that whether the member secretary can conduct training. I would be actually not for it. A basic training, a first time training should be done by experts who can clarify all the doubts for the members. I think. Uh, oh, Madam, this is Siddharth. Madam Siddharth here. Yes. So actually, uh, so, uh, so how to do this training for the EC members? Shall we do an online webinar inviting uh, um, uh, the experts or how to do it See, the best possible way number of ways of yeah number of ways of doing it you can uh, organize a training program called the experts or from the forum for ethics review committees we are conducting training program on all these basic requirements where we have very senior people who are very much experienced in the last 20 30 years on that giving talks you can invite them and ask them to conduct the program or you yourself can invite experts who are well known in this field and they conduct the training programs. So it all depends. There is nothing is fixed as of now. It's not said that yes, you go to such and such agency to get the training. That has not been specified. But what is important is who is conducting the training program. I think Balu made a statement that if you can say in the training, Balu or Dilip, or somebody made a statement that if you say that the training was done and who are the people who had given training, that part is very important. Anybody and everybody cannot give training. Training must be by the person who is well equipped and well experienced to answer the questions raised by the people. So you can choose your thing and conduct it or you, you can have organizations which are conducting it. You can now CDSA conducts lot, used to conduct lot of training program for EC members. Of course, now I think uh, they are not doing it anymore. From the Forum for Ethics Review Committees in India, FARSI, we are conducting training programs. We also suggest to people, you can have your own also organized, but please call the right people. That's the reason we are, they would like to know who are the people who actually imparted the training. Thank you, madam. Thank you. So thank you. I think uh, I will move on and I'll, uh, I'll start with my next uh, presentation, which is about uh, ethics review of multi-center research. So I'll just uh, share my screen. Uh, one second. Okay, so this is the big question and I, that's why we thought that we'll keep this topic so that uh, we can talk a little bit more about common review of multi-center research, which can easily be done in the ICMR network of institutions and we can do high quality research and uh, quick ethics reviews can be done. And it is not just quick, it is harmonized ethics committee reviews that are very important. Uh, and especially we saw during the pandemic that uh, there was ethics committees needed to be reorganized 
uh, to be able to act independently, competently, and do a time bound review because time is of essence. In order to adapt to uh, responses during the emergency, it is important that all ethics committees and in the ICMR network of institutions that we have here today, we all uh, develop and evolve and uh, adopt novel technologies, digital platforms, and uh, uh, be progressive, train ourselves, uh, look at adaptive study designs uh, more uh, you know, positively, and have virtual meetings which can be uh, more frequent, you know, so if you are meeting, let's say once in three months, you could meet monthly or maybe even twice in a month and uh, see that you have shorter agenda. So maybe you were having eight, nine items in your agenda earlier. Now you could have a meeting for only one agenda item, so two agenda item without waiting. So it is that you can meet more frequently with a shorter me meeting. And of course, electronically minutes can be recorded now. And uh, uh, one suggestion that has been made in the ICMR uh, COVID-19 guideline was that uh, the new committees uh, can be formed or you could ha have some add-on members to the committee because let's say you want to fix a meeting within the next 24 or 48 hours and certain members are not available. Then if you have a set of alternate members in place, you could, I mean, these are fully qualified members whose CVs have been uh, seen and who have signed confidentiality agreement. They are properly, you know, appointed members, but they are alternate members. So they can be appointed need based uh, members, you know, as per availability can be um, uh, invited. Also, you could think of having an identified panel of independent subject experts. So for example, you are doing a study on, let's say, uh, some infectious disease, then, you know, you have already identified certain subject experts who can be invited for that uh, meeting. Uh, these are non-voting members, but they can participate in the discussion. They can give their scientific inputs, which will help to facilitate the decisions of the ethics committees and uh, availability. So most of the institutions, you know, big institutions I've seen in other countries also, they maintain a panel of uh, independent experts, a panel of alternate members who can be called into because where time is of essence, you want to move faster. So, of course, turnaround time, you could really reduce. Uh, I mean, of course, member secretary has to work very efficiently and actively. And of course, members of the ethics committee also have to come into this mode that uh, like what we uh, saw in the CCHR where we were meeting frequently uh, during uh, that time. And um, all the members, I'm really thankful to the members of the Central Ethics Committee who responded. So the members were aware and members realized the importance that they were able to review within uh, a short time period. Uh, like we were sending the proposal on a Friday or a Saturday and the meeting is on Monday. So within that uh, uh, time, they were able to review, send the comment, which we shared with the PI. And in fact, the investigators in ICMR were also very responsive that within the same time frame, they were immediately getting back with the queries that were raised by the ethics committee. So it is very much possible that all ICMR institutes can uh, do that kind of work. But of course, it needs some protected time for the member secretary to work in that matter. And of course, video meetings, we have seen that they are pretty much good and uh, without, you know, spending, we saved money also, like we did not have to pay TADA for the whole committee and uh, they could join virtually. And if it is a three hour or two hour meeting, they were able to join for two hours. They didn't have to travel any distance uh, because availability became easier if it's a virtual meeting. So uh, all these things were helpful. So coming to the, uh, you know, the collaborative research, the collaborations are of different type. It could be just interdepartmental, you know, within your own institution, or it could be inter-institutional, or it could be national or international. It could be within the government sector. It could be with private also. So it could be of various types, you know, but whatever it is, these are all collaborative studies where the roles and responsibilities of the collaborators should be well-defined. We should know in a collaborative study, what is the responsibility of one partner and the other partner. And uh, the e distribution of uh, work has to be a part of the protocol where there is clarity so that later 
later there are no problems and this is very nicely explained in the icmr guideline if you go to the um, section on ethics issues you will find there is a lot about collaboration international collaboration also now presently most of the ethics committees that we see or hear or come across they have uh, these issues so one is that all the sites and investigators have to apply to their own ethics committees for approval this is the system followed there is a scientific review that has to be done prior to the ethics review now there are different requirements for ec submissions in format so if it is a multi center study at 10 sites all the 10 ethics committees are asking the protocol in a different format they have their own forms and there are delays in the meetings uh, and sometimes collaborative studies you know they uh, their approval is like very difficult to get you know it takes months together uh, and the problem is that we need efficient ethics committees you know if ethics committees are efficient this can uh, this barrier can be overtaken there are differences in decisions so some ethics committee may make some set of suggestions the other ethics committee may make different uh, set of suggestions and different changes in the informed consent form and this all this inhibits timely research and collaborations and investigators are really uh, you know they are so uh, worried about you know how to do research and uh, we have seen that member secretaries who are fellows they don't have protected time they are busy in their own research and it is often a add on work and just given to them and they are like doing it out of their like they are forced to do so it is very important that they are given enough time so that they can coordinate this work this ethics committee work has long been considered really part time totally honorary type of work but it is it is a time required work it it needs time attention lot of hard work is needed uh, of the member secretary needs secretarial support there is so much of filing uh, work that is involved so many communications back and forth full time secretariat has to be provided by every institute should built into the uh, equipment space uh, for filing and manpower budgets all these things have to be we don't have bioethics departments in india in any institutions i mean few have of course like st johns and some other institutions we have seen but generally 99.9% institutes don't have any bioethics support and uh, so all this becomes very difficult and that is why ethics committee cannot do the things in time because if there is no support in the secretariat then uh, they are not able to immediately respond there is lack of training of members often the trainings are more on philosophical uh, you know ethics bioethics issues uh, the principles of ethics but actually more training is needed on practical aspect how to handle when a proposal comes in what next to do how do you communicate so there are there is a need for more on practical aspects and secretariat of the ethics committee not just the members but the secretarial assistant also need to be training there are no procedures currently for monitoring we only talk about monitoring but ethics committee does not have even uh, you know any structure framework for ensuring there is compliance even if you have approved a study you don't know how to make sure that the investigator is actually following that so primary focus of review there is unbalanced uh, scientific review also because often what happens is that i have seen many committees where all the members are clinicians and there is one lay person one legal expert one social scientist and there are 12 members who are clinicians or basic scientists so when yeah, there is discussion it is completely towards science and ethics is not discussed so ethics is uh, science is important but ethics is also important so it should not be like totally only uh, science is being focused and ethics is being left out so the role of non scientific members become very important and for that you need a balanced um, composition conflicts of interest just have to be managed they have seen there are pressures from authority and sometimes you know uh, there are uh, cases where you know somebody senior a dean or a director or somebody say this approval should come by end of this day or by tomorrow so there are pressures that ethics committee has to deal with and therefore the member secretary again has to be a person who has to hold the fort uh, for the ethics committee and uh, not give in to any pressures or any conflicts of interest of any nature and uh, get the review done in a timely manner in a robust manner ensuring that there is compliance with the ethical principles and no shortcuts to good quality so 
what uh, so basically you know the uh, what do the researchers want they want quicker turnaround time and it is very easily possible for any ethics committee to become more efficient if they want to so you could think of quicker turnaround if the ethics committee is fully supported they have manpower they can do it they they will not delay the research you know nobody wants to delay research actually uh, what you see is all the stakeholders you know whether whether it's a researcher ethics committee sponsor regulator institution public everybody wants good quality research we are all sitting on the same side of the table we are not across across the table we are sitting on the same side of table we want quality everybody wants quality but we have to build in that infrastructure framework for this improved quality improved coordination having dedicated space secretarial facilitating review hand holding the researchers talking to them discussing with your perspective sharing your uh, you know because uh, ethics committees don't talk and a uh, number of times when all the members are external they they just come for a meeting and go away so there is no actual communication that is happening between researchers and the perspectives are missed out they don't know researchers don't know why ethics committee is raising all these questions and ethics committee is not understanding why a uh, researcher is not uh, following their requirements or their suggestions so we need better communication give con constructive comments sometimes minutes are so brief uh, you know it doesn't discuss what was discussed what are the issues the minutes have to have a structure where you discuss how the risks were assessed how benefits were assessed how privacy confidentialities were looked at what kind of uh, payments are involved how informed consent would be done the structuring of discussion has to be done in an ethics committee and uh, independent unbiased review there should not be ethics committees the first and foremost responsibility is to act independently giving unbiased review without any uh, conflicts of interest give standardized uh, suggestions you know standardize your working it should not be that today um, uh, the committee members are in good mood they approve everything to tomorrow they are in a bad mood they don't like any project so whatever decisions you are taking are on grounded on facts grounded in your sops in your way you function so it has to be uh, you know that's why we say when you change the members change 30% or certain members so that the continuity of the ethics committee in the way it functions is maintained their sops are followed and communication between ethics committees is not happening so if let's say icmr we can set up very easily so that's why i'm proposing that that you know within the ethics committees if we discuss um because uh, currently there is no channel of discussion between the ethics committee the communication is through the pi through the investigator so ethics committees don't know each other at all so it is very important that somehow we need to build into that communication so that we understand each the better uh, and budgetary pro provisions has to be there for academic research as i mentioned so common review of multi center research is possible we have tried it we have done it and that is that one ethics committee can take up the role of designated committee it does not mean central ethics committee alone no if you are like five centers you could decide among yourself that one of the sites uh which is probably the coordinating side can take up the leading role and their ethics committee can carry out a full ethical review the important thing to see is that all these ethics committees are registered and uh they have they decide among themselves that you know we we uh we are having this kind of communication between and we agree to a common review by one committee and then the rest of the committees can do an expedited review looking at more at the local issues which are related to inform consent translations the local concerns how participants will be recruited at the site so they can focus more on the local issues and monitoring on the site but the main ethics review can be done uh, this thing one suggestion that is there in the guideline is that members of other ethics committee can also join this meeting to give in their perspective so uh, all these we have to work out currently we don't uh, fortunately icma guidelines have opened up for you all to decide what works best for you how you would like this common review to be done so you could have a designated committee do the review and rest of them can do expedited review or you could think of an actual common meeting where there is a designated committee but members of other ethics committee also join the discussions or their member secretaries at least join the discussion and take back the comments and the discussion to their own ethics committee so that they can tell them back and focus like i mentioned and the 
whole if you if there is better communication this will actually lead to improved quality in review processes because you understand the perspectives of various sites and not just one site so an improved coordination can be done here however i like to point to you that as per our current regulations the new drugs and clinical trial rules there is slight difference in the way you handle clinical trials which are regulatory and biomedical research because for clinical trials the ethics review has to be done at the site which is within 50 kilometers range they have they have put up a clear cut criteria for so for common review uh, you need to focus on non regulatory studies which are lower risk and you know for uh, such studies you could do uh, common reviews uh, so these are the stakeholders. So there is a designated ethics committee. There are ethics committees of participating institutions who are part of the review. There could be one coordinating PI and that site could actually act as the uh, common review. And then there are local site principal investigators who all these stakeholders have to have an important role. And a letter of agreement could be signed between the ethics committees, member secretaries uh, for common review and uh, the reporting of uh, serious adverse events or other deviations, etc. could be also, it has to be, a, uh, you know, through local committees, also designated committee probably can look at the main ones and then, uh, but then it should be informed to the local ethics committees also record keeping and archiving. You have to work around that, that how this will be done and publication policy has to be in place. So there are many benefits that sp site specific modifications can be made by the respective sites for unique, uh, you know, but uh, with uh, information to the designated ethics committee and informed consent translations can be done. So I think I've already discussed. So there is an initial review or by a DEC or the designated ethics committee in a full committee meeting approvals, modification, rejection, whatever, revisions. We don't want to use the word rejection much. Uh, we, we like uh, revisions or suggestions. Of course, if it's a highly unethical study, it should be rejected also. Notify the coordinating PIs and the uh, you know ethics committees at the site. Then a coordinating PI will notify the recommendation of the designated ethics committee to site PIs. The site ethics committees also have their autonomy. So it is that they, they can conduct, if they feel that this study they would like to, it could be circulated first, but if they say that, no, this needs a full committee meeting, they, need, they can meet. Or they could do it through expedited processes without actually meeting, or even meeting virtually, it's not difficult at all, actually. So they can do their own reviews and the decision letter. So the recommendation is given by the designated ethics committee, but the decision letter will be issued by the local site ethics committee for that particular site and uh, which is coordinated to the coordinating PI for information and they need to keep the designated ethics committee informed. So this is, we have tried to, uh, we are preparing a format for letter of agreement, but this is again flexible depending on what kind of collaboration you're planning this can be done. Uh, there are challenges, it's very easy for me to say, but it is not that easy to implement on the ground. I do understand that there is a, a limited expertise available. There are procedural issues here, limited capacities, differences in review criteria, lack of trust cost, and who issues final approval. There may be ego issues also. We came across some when this was piloted in some institutions, non-ICMR institutions adverse event reporting mechanism have to be cl clarified, compensation, non-adherence to protocol. So there are all these, but actually with good communication and good secretariat support, this is quite possible. So uh, I think I will like to end with that. And I did have questions, some more questions for you all to think about that what ethical considerations can should you should inform the selection of sites for a multi-center study. So when you are trying to develop a multi-center study at that time itself, you have to think that what are the ethical requirements? Are the ethics committees prepared for this common review process? How you should select sites? Should not be just select random sites. You know, it should be done with full consideration. What should be the division of responsibilities between local and designated? This is a primary question that you need to answer if you're developing a uh, multi-center study so that you are clear in this. All this should be written down, you know, it should be part of the protocol and how to better harmonize ethics review and communications between participating five. So if you give a forethought about it, 
all these things can be sorted out and you'll not have problems. And again, common forms will come to your rescue here because if every ethics committee is using the same common form, the work of the PI gets really reduced because you are all following the same uh, system. Thank you all very much. And that was the end of my talk. And um, I, I'm sure there will be questions uh, which we'll, uh, we can take now or uh, we can uh, have uh, okay i see a lot of chat um, questions um, maybe i'll take a few questions yeah if you want to ask please ask because i'll take time to read please ask your ma'am ma hello ma'am yes uh, ma'am i want to ask that uh, i am also a member of uh, a committee in which most of the time multi centric projects are there and we do write uh, in the decision we write that we approve the project for this particular site subject to the approval by other sites but some of the members say that is it mandatory to write uh, to uh, the project to be approved by other sites like the like how this issue will be solved like uh, like so if it is a multi-center study it has to begin at the same time there could be again various types of multi-centric studies right it could be that uh, it, uh, your site could start the study other sites may start later but some studies will demand that everybody begins at the same time so when you are reviewing you must look at all these considerations we we cannot have blanket statements for every research in that manner you know so you have to, uh, you know, uh, deliberate on it that whether this site can begin the research, then you don't need to put that clause, but it depends. That's why you need the coordination with the other sites. Mm -hmm. So if there is a way to build that co coordination with other ethics committees to understand their perspectives, I think this problem will not come. You could do a common review rather than, uh, you know, separate, separate reviews and separate, separate suggestions which will really, uh, it will not facilitate research for the ethics committees have to come together now to find answers, you know. ICMR guidelines have opened it up, but the solutions have to come from the ethics committees based on your practical experiences on that protocol itself where you are deliberating. Uh, yes, ma'am. Can we say at least this thing that it should be approved from designated ethical uh, ethics committee? Can we say this line or it's not mandatory that uh, you can straight away start if it is not? <coughs> so I think uh, you are. Uh, <laughs> what I'm trying to convey is that there is nothing like mandatory or not mandatory here. You have to deliberate on this protocol that you are discussing and see what kind of ethics review is required. So it begins from member secretary, when a protocol is received by the member secretary. Actually, the member secretary has an important role in cons consultation with the chairperson to decide that what kind of research it is. Just not put it in the agenda listing and next meeting. No, you have to do a prior review at the ethics committee office you see that what kind of review is required for this protocol. Is it a single site study? Is it a double site or multi-centric study? Then you need to discuss with your chairperson that what should be the right approach to do, do a proper review for this particular protocol. So let us say it is going to be done in five institutions. Is there a possibility to, to link with the other institutions and to have a common designated meeting rather than having you know, every institution. So that means all the institutions have to be in sync with each other. So maybe you have to start small, maybe with two institutions, you could start with, you know, any protocol that's coming so that you work on all those details and then gradually mature to uh, having more institutions because currently ethics committees don't talk to each other. Yeah, but at um, least member secretaries should start talking to each other. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Ma'am, uh, I'm Hisham from NC, NIR NCD Jodhpur. I just have a question with regard to this common review, which you have told. Uh, I'm trying to uh, wrap my mind around it. Is it that uh, a designated committee will do a thorough review and the other local committees will just give inputs on a, uh, like if there are any local contextual issues, or is it that there is a, sort of a uh, expanded committee wherein physically or virtually the other committees actually sit in a uh, modified uh, new committee. I'm 
So that is what I was trying to tell you that currently we do not have any hard and fast rule in this regard. ICMR guidelines have opened up the option for you to decide how you would like to do your reviews for multicentric study. If you would like uh, to designate one ethics committee, if, if you want, and if all the sites are in sync with each other, you could have one designated ethics committee of any site Preferably the coordinating center, if there is a coordinating center, their ethics committee can do a thorough review, proper thorough review. And these recommendations can go back to the local ethics committee. Now, when the local ethics committee gets these uh, you know, uh, suggestions, recommendations, they cannot approve the local site for that site. You know, they can give recommendations. Now the secretariat in consultation with the chairperson at that site, can decide that whether they, depending on the risk involved, you know, it has to be risk dependent. If this study is highly uh, risky in nature, there are a lot of ethics issues, then they will say, we will do our own full review. You are totally, there's a total flexibility in you to decide. If you think that this recommendation seem to be good enough, you could do an expedited review by, or circulation by, you can circulate it to the members, ask them, whether you want a full meeting or you want an expedited review or through circulation, would you be able to give your comments? And accordingly, you can take a call and approve that study at your site if there is involved and you are happy with the way the designated ethics committee has reviewed it. So there is a flex. Uh, the other thing is, if, the if there is better coordination, you could actually have members from other ethics committee or at least member secretaries also participating in the main designated ethics committee meeting. That is also possible. Yes, ma'am. Madam, good afternoon, Dr. Sridhar here. Can I, I join here for this question? To... Uh, I think Dr. Sridhar wants to ask maybe yes. one question. Yeah. Good afternoon, madam. This is regarding the multicentric studies only. We have a lot of difficulties facing in this issue. I am from IEC chair at NIRT, Chennai. So what I suggest is whenever there is a proposal for multicentric study, we can have an expedited review in all the IECs concerned and then can have a common VC on a Zoom platform or something like that so that we can clarify all the inputs from the members so that a single decision can be made. Otherwise, whenever the IEC faces individually, there are a lot of corrections and other things wanted. This takes a lot of time. So to avoid that, we can have a SOP where in which the individual committee can go through that through expedited process. All the inputs can be had on a common platform on a common meeting. As I suggested, as a single meeting, it can be solved. That will cut short the time. Yes, you are absolutely right. There could there has to be a SOP also for this yes. common review that needs to be developed. We are that trying to come up with a guideline because based on our experience, and hopefully we should be doing that is one of our pending activities. Uh, we want to come out with a more detailed guideline on common review for multicenter. Thank you. Thank you. But and madam, many system. times some of the centers, they are recruited later on in the, during the course of the trial, particularly in the clinical trials and pharma funded trials, many times some of the centers are recruited later. So this common uh, ethics review may not be applicable in these situations because the other sites, the newly joining sites, they have to mandatorily conduct something. Yeah, you are right. And like I said, for clinical trials, there's a separate requirement because clinical trials have to follow the new drugs clinical trial rules where common review of multicenter research is not a provision. It is not a provision for clinical trials. And madam, my question is whether there is any provision of looking at the functioning of the institutional ethics committees post registration. Because many of the ethics committees are not actually going for accreditation or NABH assessment or something yes. like that. 99% of the ethics committees probably are not being accredited. So yes. what is the provision from ICMR uh, or uh, ICMR so, guidelines or something? Uh, yeah, so uh, I think this actually we were trying to make a bill if you would know that ICMR had drafted a biomedical and health research regulation bill and where a separate authority was to be set up uh, and that was be responsible not only for registration, but also monitoring, handling complaints and all that. Uh, anyway, that could not come through. And now the responsibility has been uh, shifted to the Department of Health Research under the new drugs and clinical trial rules 
to set up an office for ethics committee registration. So it is actually the DHR is taking up that role that DHR is registering and uh, they may uh, you know, ask you or they may do a random check because it's all evolving process. So as of now, it is uh, being framed. So uh, currently only the initial registrations are happening now, but yes, eventually I think there will be uh, you know, some checks and balances and uh, although because the problem in India is large numbers, you know, so even CDSCO is required to monitor ethics committees, but uh, that, that capacity uh, is to be developed, you know, it's not that simple. Yeah, but through reports and all, uh, I think the provisional and uh, main registration is also catering to that. So they give a provisional registration be beginning, but then uh, the full registration is given after two years. So there after may be some years. random checks. I think the DHR the will be, uh, ma'am is here and madam will be able to answer it better. They, they may plan random checks in the due course of time. Yes, we should be ready for that audit so any that time. Should be, yes. That should be a good option. For uh, can I just add something, Dr. Roli? Yes, Dr. Ude. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, an answer to what uh, the previous uh, um, scientist was saying, the very fact that we're getting certification of DHR itself is accreditation. Okay, you could take it as one sort of accreditation because basically they're giving you a certificate which is valid for so and so period. So uh, random checks and all, uh, I don't know how far everybody will be uh, able to manage with the HR part of it or what and having a separate accredited. Maybe if NICIT is able to do it, please, you'll be the first persons to come forward and get yourself checked up regularly. Okay, fine. Sir, that I am from said, a medical college sorry, background, uh, so I had seen so many things there because these new things are coming, this registration and other things. So I am very new in this ICMR Institute, but I was in medical colleges for several years earlier in my life. So I had seen yeah. different types uh, of uh, working things there. So that's why I, I was asking. Sorry, sir. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I already, like Dr. Roli has already noted, uh, uh, there are scientists who are doing additional work, apart from their own work, as far as ethics companies are concerned. So if you are going to have inspections quarterly or half yearly, it will become a real uh, a big uh, problem, I suppose so. Okay, fine. Uh, Dr. Roli, one point I had was, see, what, what happens is that whenever our scientists are applying for uh, outside funding agencies, um, they would ask for an ethics committee certification. Um, uh, or sometimes to finish the codal formalities, you are supposed to give a... a, a certificate saying that uh, ethic company uh, has approved or whatever it is in which case what we do is based on the exigency of situation we send the, the proposal by um, uh, email uh, take a formal approval and ratify it in the next fiscal meeting now i think that's a uh, that's a quite a valid uh, thing i suppose so because uh, and most of the times really very frankly quite a few people come one week before and say that See, 28th is my uh, 28th is my uh, last day to apply, and today is 21st. So why can't ethics committee have a meeting before that? In one week, how can I uh, arrange for a meeting, madam? Because why? so why many not? people. Why not? At least uh, at our end, it is difficult. There are uh, yes, all the outside. Uh, that is the point I'm trying to make. That ethics committees should become more efficient. They should Not try to have more meetings. They should meet more frequently with smaller agendas. If they ah. should try to oh. do it faster. Oh. They can do it if they want to. Of course, uh, one week may be too short also, but you have to try to reduce your timeline for meetings. Oh, true. We, we have, uh, sorry, you sorry have to interrupt. Also, ethics committee should put their foot down also. Like you can fix the date for some, like you see HMSC. HMSC, they will not accept your proposal even if it is one hour late. If the deadline for submission is 25th or 5 p.m., then 6 p.m. also they will not take it. So, you know, the same way ethics committee has to put up their calendar and it should be visible on your website. So the members, yeah. uh, you know, your scientists know that the next ethics committee meeting is on this date. And my proposal, if it is submitted by this date, will be considered. If not, it will go to the next month committee. So we have to put a calendar of our activities to streamline yeah. it for the institution. Yeah, I mean, we actually plan it every quarterly, uh, three, six, nine, 12 months. But 
you every quarterly i mean the, the, that's the uh, program you follow but however what happens is delicacies come in sensitivities come in it's your own colleagues and then uh, <laughs> anyway so COVID my point is that covid point was different like we had all unscheduled meetings and uh, now so we are uh, revising the respond whole thing. see ethics committee should facilitate the research right you have to tell the you have to educate the researchers that you know these are our problems but there is nothing like what you said that we just circulate and then take approval and later it goes to the meeting that is uh, that is a violation of your sop so that no, but then the, that was we were doing in covid times right no no you have to follow your emergency sop and do a review okay we'll create an sop then okay fine Right. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, can I say something? Yes, Dr. Raj Lakshmi. Ma'am, uh, this is getting back to the multi-center, uh, which were uh, multi-center studies, not trials. And uh, just like to share our experience because I think all the SMR institutes are involved in this mega TV project. And uh, when this study was proposed, uh, we were all asked to take our individual ethics committee approvals. We are fine with that, but we had repeatedly requested the lead team at ICMR to take up the central ethics committee approval. For very long, this was um, not agreed upon. We all started our own procedures because what we feared is 27 ethics committees are going to have their own views and they are going to give us our own comments. So the uniformity of the study, because it was supposed to be a common protocol to be implemented in the same way across all states of India. So I think in practice, this has also happened. Finally, they did agree to go for central ethics committee approval. Even that is in process. And our committees are also in process. Some have received, some have given comments, which we now need to revise. Our personally at NIV also, we have received some suggestions and we are going for revision. So the uniformity is disturbed in this case, ma'am. Is there any solution to this kind of problem? So this is exactly the type of study that should come to a designated ethics committee. So within the participating institutions, you could decide what who will be the designated ethics committee and take the ethics committees on board. So it is easily possible in the ICMR network because we are a small network of institutions and following the same, uh, you know, same requirements all in the same uh, background. So we can do that. You could do a designated at your institution. If it is the coordinating site, you can, your ethics committee can take up that role uh, and other sites can play the role of the local ethics committee and do only the site related issues. If the risk involved is less, you can see that it's a, not a clinical trial. You could do that. Somebody has to take a lead. <laughs> Dr. Roli, uh, Dr. Vikram from uh, ICMR NIRCH. Uh, sorry to just, uh, you know, just continue on this point, but I feel in this case where 27 ICMR institutes are involved, shouldn't the Central Ethics Committee be the designated? Sure. We are really willing to do I, I think this would solve a lot of problems. Sure, because, we are uh, very know, happy. I, I, I happy. think at least in this case, as Dr. Rajnakmi suggested, it should be done. We are also having the same thing. We also went through the review, but I feel if the there will be some difference in opinion between uh, each uh, ethics committee, it may delay the process. Sure, sure. We have reviewed more than 40 protocols in the last two years. So why not this also? <laughs> so so uh, for studies of this proportion, I think uh, it is better. I mean, at least sure. from the headquarters, I think this should be you know, uh, looked upon. Sure. Agree. Good afternoon, ma'am. This is Dr. Chandan from uh, NITM uh, Belgave, ma'am. Yes, Dr. Chandan. Uh, Ma'am, uh, in uh, studies, multi-center studies involving tribal population, as it's vulnerable population, should a full committee meeting should be held at all uh, local sites? Okay. So again here, um, mm, let me look at the exact wording in the guideline because we have said that uh, for vulnerable, we have not yet come out with a detailed guideline on common reviews. But again, uh, the designated ethics committee, if you're doing a common review through a designated committee, then I think the still the local ethics committees, uh, because it's a, you are seeing research in tribal populations. So all the sites are doing the same kind of research. Everybody's working on tribal population, is it? Uh, if we plan as a multicentric study from our end, and yeah. then if we give to other institutes where there are tribal populations, and yes. then do then in that case. 
So I think that flexibility can still be extended to them to decide whether they want to do a full review or they can do expedited review. And also, by the way, in my experience, I've found that we can do a full review even more quickly than expedited reviews. <laughs> because when if, if, if I fix a meeting in, let's say, 48 hours, two days from now, and I have a meeting, the decision can be taken. But when I circulate to members and they do not respond, sometimes expedited can get delayed. So we should not think that full review will delay our research. If, if we can meet more frequently, full reviews will actually facil facilitate your research and quick decisions. But yeah, for tribal population, I think the individual side should look at how important, relevant, and how much risk is there. If they want to meet, uh, we ask the members whether this study you want to meet, you want us to have a proper meeting, or whether you are willing to do an expedited review. And according to the suggestions that come in from the members, uh, we decide about the review process. Thank you, Amanda. I have one more question regarding to insurance, ma'am. Can I ask now or? Insurance. Actually, we are running out of time. We can continue uh, discussions. Uh, why, uh, would you mind writing an email on the insurance questions? Because I see the hand of Dr. Sriram. Yes, ma'am. That will, that will be fine, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, please. Thank you. Uh, ma'am, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, this is regarding this uh, uh, Central Ethics Committee. Because uh, as you remember, and uh, uh, someone mentioned that for the National TB Prevalence Survey, we took the advice of Central Ethics Committee and then we had a designated ethics committee. So here I wanted to understand uh, in the upcoming uh, or in the evaluation has uh, CCHR will approve or give only directions to go to designated ethics committee. Because if designated ethics committee is also going to do a coordination and central ethics committee is also going to do that. So then uh, how that duplication can be avoided? Okay. So central ethics committee in case of multi-center research, if it is submitted becomes the designated committee actually. It becomes a designated committee. It is not two different committees. For one study, there would be one designated ethics committee. So it could be central ethics committee if you want the central ethics committee to review or your, your NIRT ethics committee can become the designated ethics committee. And if you are not submitting the project to central ethics committee. Did I clarify your point? Uh, yeah. Uh, because in the previous uh, uh, time, uh, when we approached a CCHR, uh, they gave directions to go for forming a designated ethics committee. Yeah, because that time your ethics committee had referred the study to central ethics committee for advice. Okay. But we were not playing the role of a designated ethics committee because you are the coordinating site and you were doing it for all the sites. Okay. Okay. Understood. Thank you. I think Dr. Faguni, I think with that, I think that would be the last question and then yes, we'll move on. <laughs> Dr. So, Faguni. Yes, ma'am. I'm from NICEP. So uh, regarding the TV project, today only I received an email from Somya in headquarters that this is due with Central Ethics Committee. So we have, uh, like, we also have applied for Institutional Ethics Committee, but hope that we'll receive it from the CH, uh, Central Ethics Committee. But regarding other projects like which NICED or any other institute is uh, uh, heading and uh, it is involved with the many uh, medical uh, colleges in the state or out of the state. In that case, I have faced a problem that in some medical colleges, they are going for full board review. As an institution, we are also going for a full board review. But a few medical colleges, like they are in two minds, whether they need a full board review or just an NOC, administrative NOC is uh, uh, like, uh, okay to go ahead with the data collection process and everything. So actually they what they were asking like whether they need a full board review or just if they issue an administrative NOC from the principal or someone that will be suffice. So in that area, actually, I'm not clear what to tell them, like, sh shall they go for full board review or. So first of all, there is no administrative NOC okay. by an ethics committee. Okay. Right. Yeah. If an ethics committee is reviewing a project, it is taking full responsibility for the consequences, monitoring what happens in that study at that site. Okay. So there is nothing like an NOC kind of thing. Okay. The designated ethics committee or central ethics committee review is to facilitate the review at your end, which means that you can do an expedited review 
to fast track your uh, review by not having a full committee meeting uh, but to do it more quickly that is the purpose but final approval for that site will be issued by the local ethics committee okay. so they are not like washing their hands off that oh this ECHR has seen so for example central ethics committee has seen so now we are like we don't have anything to do with that it's not like that okay ma'am central ethics committee has given an overall recommendation a approval for the study and looked at all the ethics aspects so that you know they are taken and they are not done by multiple people but they are taken care so most probably that study will be in good shape with all the clarifications everything sorted out by one committee and then other ethics committees can do an expedited review to see that you know still they have any issues local issues specifically then they are free to decide to do expedited review or full review but finally they are the ones who are responsible to issue the approval letter to the site pi okay ma'am thank you thank you so i think <laughs> if there are no more questions uh, there are a lot of questions in the chat but i have not been able to read i think um, uh, we, we can maybe take one more question i yeah, like or... to comment on this multi centric study issue you know after listening to all the questions and responses my suggestion to all uh, institutes of icmr would be that be courageous and take up multi centric research and become a designated ethics committee the temptation to submit to central ethics committee is too huge and the purpose of this discussion is to empower icmr institutes to become as relevant as the central ethics committee for their own network studies that you do all your network studies will not be limited to only icmr you could be part of non icmr studies also the it will be uh, an experience which you will gain after doing one or two studies as was said maybe start with a few multi centric studies where there are three centers four centers and then gradually expand over this it will be a tremendous learning experience for the ethics committee of the institution as well as you know it will set out lot of sops and uh, training processes which will go into place and it helps a lot in building up that confidence if you are the coordinating center for that multi centric study so i would actually like to recommend to all icmr institutions to become designated centers for ethics review and because this is multi centric designated this uh, review is not a shortcut it is only to facilitate faster harmonious and good quality reviews which should be undertaken by many more icmr institutions thank you so thank you so much for that comment and uh, that brings us towards the end of the session and i am very glad and grateful to mrs anu nagar joint secretary department of health research for joining us today here in ncdir for taking time out of her busy schedule and uh, i'll briefly introduce her that she is from the 1995 batch officer himachal pradesh cadre of indian forest services and an an alumnus of the himachal pradesh university she had joined dhr in the year 2019 as the difficult time set in as joint secretary of the department of health research ministry of health and family welfare she is as at present the in charge of the national ethics committee registry for biomedical and health research set up there she is also in charge of various other divisions in dhr such as alternate system of medicines international health clinical trial registry of india in interministerial coordination for the e samiksha data governance platform and the centralized public grievance redressal and monitoring system various programs of ministry of health and family welfare such as vrdl hrd and gia schemes tb consortium etc 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 ma'am is also member secretary of the technical appraisal committee of the health technology assessment in india she was awarded with the digital innovation award under the category innovations in pandemic by honorable president on 30th december 2020 ma'am we are very honored to have you and we would like to hear from you uh, your thoughts on this program thank you thank you so much uh, dr roni um, dr vasant muthuswami chairperson of cechr 
Dr. Mathur, Director, NCDIR, Dr. Ruli, uh, my colleagues from DHR, Sujata, Balu, and Dilip, all the organizers of this workshop and distinguished participants all present. And I'm very happy to see that there are more than 140 participants uh, registered today. And this really gives us a lot of encouragement. Dr. Vasanta, it was really a pleasure listening to you. It was such an enlightening uh, talk that you made right from the history of uh, how ethics evolved and onto your concerns for training of uh, ethics committee, which we have actually noted and we'll work out with Dr. Roli and team and see how we can actually contribute towards it. Um, Dr. Mathur for taking this leadership role and uh, Dr. Roli, who's, who's actually the, um, you know, the leader of the country in this particular area. And I'm really grateful to her for all the support she's always given to DHI. And uh, like uh, Dr. Roli has already explained it to you that our role came in with the uh, formulation of rules of uh, uh, the Drugs and Cosmetic Act, wherein it has been made compulsory that all the institutes who are taking up uh, biomedical research must have an ethics committee registered with the DHR. So now the DHR in this case assumes a role of a regulator. And obviously when we assume this role apart from registration, it is also our responsibility that we see that the guidelines are followed in full letter and spirit. And we are also responsible for the monitoring part, which was actually taken up, which we will actually be subsequently taking up. Our first step right now is the registration part. And for that, I would like to tell you all, as explained by Dr. Sujata and Dr. Balu, the process is totally digital. It is a paperless system where uh, right from, you know, login to final registration, there is no paper submission involved at all. There is also a provision of e-hastakshir. So you don't even need to send your uh, credentials for login. So uh, we have tried to facilitate it as much as we can. Mm -hmm. But uh, like uh, Dr. Vasan just said that the uh, ICMR, um, since ICMR is the apex institution for all the biomedical research in the country and the country has gratefully acknowledged its role during the pandemic, I would also implore upon you to now be the conscious keepers and uh, maintain the quality of science, the responsibility that we all have. So it's very important that all the ICMR institutes at least first get registered. And as per the information that I have with me, there are 14 institutes which have a final registration or a provisional registration, but it really uh, pains me to see that there are many institutes which have not registered them at all. And if Dr. Priya is there, I would like to um, kind of say that institutes uh, like NIV, NYSED and others, which are actually receiving a lot of funding and which I would say that are doing a lot of research so they really need to take this up in a big way and first of all, get registered with this. We are here to assist you all in whatever help that you might need. And uh, so I'll not be naming others and I'm sorry for uh, singling you out, but I would really like to say that it is important that as leaders of science, we need to first put our own house in order and get all of us registered first. So my first request to you and uh, later on, we uh, like uh, we have already 400 plus committees registered with us, although our target is 4,000 and uh, we would be actually scaling up this. And we have also ensured that if all your documents are provided as per the details listed, that we will not take more than two weeks to register. So we are now expediting our process and uh, uh, there is no reason why people should not register. Uh, following guidelines is very important and uh, we would like to also uh, associate with Dr. Ruli uh, in kind of whatever trainings that you might like to organize and uh, training is a very important aspect for all of us and we would also like to facilitate by providing you online modules 
and kind of modules which you know you can take up as per your leisure as per your convenience but there has to be uh, fully trained people that is very clear that we do need training on this uh, there are also a few other things like uh, somebody just said that how many proposals have been rejected there was a question but what i have seen since i've come to uh, dhr is that ethics clearance is required everywhere whether it is hmsc whether you know it is a proposal of diamonds that a proposal that we have on molecular oncology whenever we are releasing funds for granting aid so ethics is something which is very integral to our science so it's only kind of you know uh, having the right kind of committees and delivering the kind of results that we actually expect and uh, i would say as a uh, from an administrator's perspective i would say that yes we should also kind of reject proposals why not you know it is when we are, i'm sorry i might be on the uh, kind of other approach on this but ethics has to be you know um, i think it's uh, like a moral policeman you know saying that yes this is right and this is not we can always improve things but what is wrong would be wrong and i would say that uh, we could also say no whenever we wanted to so this is all from my side and i really congratulate dr roli for organizing this wonderful session and uh, we are i assured you that we are here available to you as a team here we are all sitting together and whatever uh, help or assistance or whatever support that you might need we are ready to provide you with thank you thank you very much paul very much and i hand it over to dr dilip for the final words <laughs> thank you ma'am thank you as we move closer to the training program it's it gave me immense pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks on behalf of icmr bioethics unit icmr ncdir my heartfelt gratitude to shrimati annagar ma'am joint secretary department of health research for taking time out of her busy schedule to join us and share her valuable thoughts on the program my sincere thanks to our respected director dr prashant mathur for his unparalleled support and encouragement in organizing the event i extend my gratitude to dr vasanda muthuswami chairperson icmr cechr and dr roli mathur head icmr bioethics unit whose efforts has been fundamental in this initiative uh, my special thanks to uh, dr sujatha and dr balu from dhr for enriching us with knowledge on the recent updates in biomedical and research ethics my deepest appreciation to all directors of icmr institutes chairpersons member secretary for member secretaries of ethics committees and uh, uh, and other icmr scientists and all those who has shown great interest in participating in the program i would also take the opportunity to thank the members of uh, uh, ncdir iec who has traveled and joined us today here i hope that uh, the event has been fruitful in enriching our minds and look forward to your continued support and participation in the forthcoming events last but not the least i am very thankful to the it support administrative division and the entire organization team of icmr ncdir and dhr for their incessant effort and cooperation in making this event a grand success thank you thank you thank you and bye bye